Ghost Stories, Book 4 in the Witchwood's Funeral Home series, written by Morgana Best, narrated by Amy Soakes. Chapter 1 It was an otherwise pleasant day in the small Australian town of Witchwood's, situated inland in the mountains. The sun was shining on a pleasant scene, a landscape of beautiful rose gardens and fruit trees. Two pet sheep were grazing happily on their lush pasture beyond, and kookaburras were singing in the gum trees. The pleasant scent of star jasmine wafted along on the gentle breeze. There was one blight on this happy vista. My mother was bending over her mandarin tree with a pruning saw. I warned you, she addressed the sapling in a stern tone. I said if you have bugs next year, out you come, and you have them. Mum, I cleared my throat. Laurel, she seemed surprised to see me, but quickly recovered, and bent over once more to saw viciously at the tree. I thought you'd be here five minutes ago. I wanted you to meet my first guests, she said with her back turned. I was somewhat concerned, to say the least. Since I had moved out of Mum's house after finally renovating the apartment above the funeral home, Mum had decided to rent out my old room, as well as the spare rooms, to paying guests. While it might sound like a good idea in theory, I didn't know how many guests she would keep once they had met her. Mum, if you don't mind me saying so, don't try to force them all to go to your church. She swung around, brandishing the pruning saw at me. How could you say such a thing, Laurel? I would never force anyone to go to my church. What a terrible thing to say. Anyway, I'll have you know that they're all theologians. I wondered why a group of theologians would go on vacation together, but I thought it better not to ask her. That will make for lovely dinner conversation, I said dryly. My mother's eyes lit up. Exactly. And here they are now, right on time. Theologians are always timely. I shook my head. There was simply no response to that. Three cars arrived one after the other. The people who got out of the cars didn't look like theologians. Not that I had ever seen a theologian. I supposed I expected someone who looked like an old oil painting of John Wesley or John Knox. To the contrary, they seemed to be about my mother's age, but were all nicely dressed and were not wearing somber expressions. I'm Thelma Bay, and this is my daughter Laurel, who owns the funeral home just over there, she said as she pointed to the nearby building. She does a wonderful funeral, if you know anyone who has passed away. She gave me an encouraging nod, while I stood rooted to the spot, embarrassed. The theologians introduced themselves each in turn. I must ask Pastor Green to dinner, Mum said happily. I told him you were coming and he was beside himself with excitement. He has lots of questions for you. They all exchanged glances. The man standing closest to me spoke. That's good to hear. Sadly, many ministers don't like what we write about. My mother shook her head. What a terrible thing. We are all members of the one body, some feet, some head, some legs, some hands. Yet we all make up the same body. We should not be at odds with one another. The guests looked confused. Well, I'm glad to hear your pastor has an open mind, the man who had introduced himself as James said, while his wife nodded. Yes, Pastor Green is very open-minded, Mum said. He even speaks to anti-Calvinists. She shook her head in disgust. I told him that your specialty was the Holy Ghost. He's looking forward to a good discussion of the Trinity. The guests appeared even more confused. The Holy Ghost, James and his wife Jenny said in unison. Yes, Mum said. Aren't you writing about the Holy Spirit? You said you were seeking the Spirit. James frowned. Spirits, ghosts, he said, gesturing to the others. We're a writer's group. Every year we come to Witchwoods for a holiday to do some writing. This year we chose to write ghost stories. Mum's eyes narrowed. So you're not theologians.
Chapter 2 After Mum's horrible shock finding out that the writers were not theologians, she had decided to go for a road trip to the Gold Coast. There were two problems with that. The first was that she was a terrible driver. The second was that she had absolutely no sense of direction. It was the latter that I was currently addressing. But mum, if you don't want to use a GPS, I can show you how to use your iPhone, I said. Again? I don't know why you won't use the TomTom. Quit repeating yourself, Laurel. Anyway, I don't know anyone called Tom. I bit my tongue. It's Tom Tom. To be honest, mum, I really don't think you should go on this road trip. Not unless you have someone to escort you. My mother's face lit up. Escort me? Great idea, Laurel. She shot me a rare smile and hurried back in the direction of her house. I was puzzled, but at least she was in a good mood for once. I turned back to my paperwork, but found it hard to concentrate. I soon caught myself staring out the window at Basil's two pet sheep, Arthur and Martha, grazing happily on my land to one side of the funeral home. I had been happy of late. The funeral home was starting to be profitable, thanks to my idea of staging celebrity-themed funerals. My relationship with Basil, my accountant, and now something more, was going nicely. For one, he shared my gift for being able to see ghosts. Better still, he was a good cook, and he could handle my mother. And indeed, the greatest reason for my happiness was that I had escaped from my mother. I had fled from her once before and had gone to live in Melbourne, but my father died and left the funeral business to me. From the time I had moved back from Melbourne to take over the running of the business, I had been living in my old bedroom in her house, perched on an adjoining plot of land directly behind the funeral home. I was now living in my newly renovated apartment over the funeral home. While I would have preferred to live further away from my mother, such as the South Pole or Mars, the distance was sufficient for me to retain my sanity. The sound of someone at the entrance brought me to my feet. It turned out there were seven people at the entrance, my mother and her new guests. I'm giving them a guided tour of the funeral home, she announced proudly. I nodded. I could hardly refuse, because that would make a scene. I was glad I had placed a locked door at the bottom of the steps to my own apartment, as I had no doubt Mum would show the guests my apartment as well. She had no concept of personal boundaries. I had not seen the guests since their arrival, so Mum saw fit to introduce me to them once more. And this is James and Jenny Thorogood, she concluded, ignoring all six of them saying that we had already met. I'm sorry, it's Thorogood, Jenny said. It's pronounced Thorogood. Mum rounded on her. Excuse me? Jenny ignored my warning look and pushed on. I'm Jenny Thorogood. You're not, Mum exclaimed. There is none good, no, not one. Romans chapter 3 verse 10. I sighed. Mum, that's righteous, not good. Mum folded her arms. How would you know anyway? You never go to church. And I'll have you know, Laurel, that the explanatory notes at the bottom of my Bible page clarify that God meant to say good, not righteous. She shot me a smug, sanctimonious look. Ernie, the funeral home's resident ghost, materialized behind her. Your mother's a complete nutter. She's a cheeseburger short of a happy meal. I ignored Ernie and addressed Mum. That's not very nice. Ernie evidently thought I was talking to him. Don't shoot the messenger. Mum was on a roll. And Laurel, if you ever did bother to come to church, you will know that verse 12 says there is none that doeth good. Ernie vanished. I shrugged and took my leave while Mum was calling scriptures after me. Mercifully, I missed most of it, but it was something about open sepulchres and poisonous asps. I walked over to the sheep, but Basil was already there. I was coming to see you on my lunch break, but I saw your mother go in, so I came here to escape from her. 
That's the same reason I'm here, I confessed. She was giving her six guests a guided tour of my business. Basil pinched the top of his nose. That's just it. It's your business. Do you want me to speak to her? I shook my head. Thanks, but no. I'll handle her. She's going on that road trip to the Gold Coast any day. Is Ian going with her? I laughed at that. No, that wouldn't be appropriate, to use her words. But don't ask me how she'll find her way. Ian was Mum's much younger and equally annoying friend. He had a long-suffering girlfriend, Audrey, who did not go to Mum and Ian's church, much to Mum's horror. Basil leant on the top of the fence. Yes, your mother has absolutely no sense of direction. With any luck, she'll end up in Perth, I said optimistically. Don't get your hopes up, Basil said with a smile. After she drives for five days, she might realise she's heading in the wrong direction. I laughed and fed the sheep some treats. Anyway, she said she'd get a GPS, but she's hopeless with technology. She'll call me every few minutes to ask me how to work it. Basil kissed the top of my head. How about I take you to dinner tonight and we can forget about your mother? I readily agreed. The subject of mum's road trip did not come up again, so I assumed she had somehow managed to find a suitable GPS. A few days later, I was sitting in my office, catching up on the remaining paperwork after a particularly busy week when mum called. I answered the phone at once. He's dead, mum said between sobs. Who? I said. Tom. I paused with my pen in mid-air. Don't worry, mum. I know technology can be stressful. Just get a new one. Mum gasped. How could you be so heartless, Laurel? Besides, I don't have any money left after paying for this one. The police will be here soon. With that, she hung up. I shrugged and went back to my paperwork. Mum was always melodramatic. She was due to leave for the Gold Coast the following morning, so I supposed her anxiety over the road trip had come to a head. The sound of sirens and the simultaneous appearance of Ernie, the resident ghost, brought me to my feet. You look like you've seen a ghost, Ernie quipped. Not funny, I said. It was the first time, but now it's got old. Anyway, I've got to run. I think mum called the police because her GPS stopped working. Ernie paled, quite a feat considering he was semi-transparent. I don't know how to tell you this, Laurel. Tell me what? You'll find out. With that, he vanished. I sighed and hurried outside to see why the police were here. As I rounded the corner, I saw an ambulance as well. Had something happened to Mum? I rushed along the pathway. To my relief, Mum was alive and well and speaking to Duncan, the town's sergeant and the husband of my best friend, Tara. What's going on, Duncan? I knew better than to ask my mother for a logical explanation. Duncan patted my shoulder. Laurel, I'm afraid there's been a death. I frowned. You know it's a GPS, right? Surely mum hadn't lost the plot so much as to call the police just because her tom-tom had stopped working. Duncan took a step back, a look of shock on his face. What? You know, a tom-tom. It's just Tom, you silly girl, my mother said. His name's not Tom-Tom. Why are you stuttering? Panic hit me in the pit of my stomach. Can someone explain? Duncan patted my shoulder again. Laurel, there's a dead man in your mother's house. My jaw fell open. I've already told Laurel that, Mum said. It's her fault. My fault? I parroted. Yes, you were the one who thought I was a silly old fool and needed an escort for the road trip. I called an escort agency and asked for Tom. Tom? I thought I would faint. The landscape appeared to be receding. Why do you keep repeating everything I say? Mum demanded. I asked the escort agency for a man called Tom, and they said he could be anything I wanted. I said I only needed him to get me there. My jaw dropped. Mum pushed on. And they said they'd never had any complaints about him. Ernie materialised behind Mum. 
He's naked. Naked? I asked without thinking. The corpse, of course, Ernie added. Duncan and Mum, not being able to see ghosts, thought I was addressing them. Mum gasped. How did you know? Tom died in my bedroom, she said as she winced. And to make it worse, yes, he was naked. Mum, why was he naked? Mum covered her eyes with both her hands. I've never seen a naked man, not in all my born days, and in broad daylight at that. How shameful, dying with his clothes off. I knew I should have hired an escort from my church. Only when I asked Pastor Green where I could get an escort, he acted weird about it. I ran my hands through my hair in exasperation. Mum, why was he naked? I asked again. Mum looked genuinely puzzled. I don't know. I'm as perplexed as you are. We were supposed to start the road trip tomorrow, but his fee started today. He said he wanted to get to know me. He went up to my bedroom while I made a cup of tea. I did wonder why he needed to look in my bedroom, she added as an afterthought. I don't think you should say anything else, Mrs. Bay, Duncan said to Mum. Why not? I asked him. The detectives will be here soon. For a moment, I wondered if I were dreaming. This was all so surreal. Detectives? Duncan nodded. He was murdered, and the detectives will need to question your mother. I gasped. Are you sure he was murdered? Couldn't it have been a heart attack or something? This was all going downhill rapidly. Duncan's face was grim. He was definitely murdered. I turned to mum. How did he die? What's going on? I swung around to see Basil. Duncan did his best to explain while I supplied the extra information. Basil had known my mother long enough to figure out what had happened. In fact, he appeared to have a better grasp of the situation than I did. I'll call you a lawyer, Mrs. Bay. A lawyer? Mum squealed. Why do I need a lawyer? God is the judge. I'll answer to no judge but God. Oh, good. Pastor Green and Ian are here, finally. Right behind Mum, I could see the figure of a man trying to materialize. This must be the murdered escort, I reasoned. It took him a few moments, and then he materialized fully. I gasped. Not one stitch of clothing covered the ghost. No wonder Mum didn't notice how he died. Her shock would have been too great. Basil at once put his hands over my eyes. Oh, my gosh, he said loudly. What's wrong? Duncan and Mum said in unison. Uh, Laurel shouldn't be out in the sun without sunglasses. It's the glare. She's had sore eyes lately. That's right, I said, while trying to peek between his fingers. Chapter Three this is all your fault, Mum said with more than a little aggression, pointing directly at Pastor Green, who, along with Ian, was hurrying over to us. Thankfully, the naked ghost had dematerialized, for the moment anyway. Oh, I beg your pardon, he said, looking confused. I suspected that perhaps he was at a bit of a loss as to how a strange naked man wound up dead in my mother's bedroom. You didn't tell me where to find an escort when I asked. Mum sounded angrier than ever, though I suspected at least part of it was due to the shock. You kept avoiding the subject and giving me strange looks, and I still don't know why. Well, um, Pastor Green hesitated and cleared his throat. You simply asked me if I knew how you could get in touch with, well, with an escort. Ian rubbed his forehead and I sighed loudly. Pastor Green looked deeply embarrassed and Mum continued to wear an expression of anger mixed with confusion. Yes, and you wouldn't tell me, she exclaimed, throwing her hands in the air. Well, that's because I thought you were referring to the other kind of escort, Pastor Green explained nervously, avoiding eye contact. The personal kind. The, uh, very personal kind. Well, he came alone, so it seems like he intended to escort me there personally, 
How much more personal could it get? Mum asked. Very, I muttered under my breath, hoping this would all be over soon. That is, I didn't think you were referring to the kind of escort service that literally escorted you to another place, Pastor Green explained, staring at his shoes and losing more and more subtlety with each passing moment. What other kind is there? Mum had lost some of her angry edge, but appeared to be more confused than ever. Um, you asked for Tom from an escort service, you see. So I assumed, that is, um... Pastor Green's voice trailed off as his face turned a bright shade of red. I'd never seen him nearly so nervous or at a loss for words before. Rather than taking you somewhere in the world, they take you somewhere physically, or rather emotionally, through their actions. That is to say, they, um, he broke off again, and the explanation was clearly lost on mum. To be fair, I knew what was going on, and his explanation was lost on me as well, so maybe she wasn't entirely to blame. Mum rounded on me. It's all your fault, Laurel. I raised an eyebrow. Yes, you told me it was a good way to get directions, she explained. I sighed loudly. You mean a tom-tom, right? Yes, Tom. Are you all right? Why are you stuttering again? Before I could answer, Basil's hands flew over my eyes once more, blocking my vision entirely. What are you doing? I asked, more confused than ever in an already horribly confusing series of events. Trust me, he whispered. I did, but I also appreciated not having his hands over my eyes without explanation, so I pushed them away all the same. Of course, I immediately discovered why Basil had done it. Standing directly in front of me once more was the victim's ghost, still as naked as he had been when he died. I cleared my throat as Basil and I looked at each other nervously. The ghost was jumping up and down to try and get our attention, which, given his nudity, made me want to look away even more. I still don't understand, Mum said, and I realized that I had tuned out of the conversation entirely. As far as I could tell, Pastor Green was still desperately dancing around a simple explanation, while Mum was insisting on one as firmly as she could. It was hard to blame Pastor Green for not simply coming out and explaining the mistake. Knowing Mum, she'd be even more upset by the truth than she was by the confusion. There was really no easy way out of it for the poor guy, and I thought that I should interject or otherwise change the subject. Still, I suspected that would be especially hard to do with a naked ghost bouncing all over the place trying to get my attention. Before I could think of anything to say, a car screeched to a halt, and two men emerged from it. One was tall and muscular, middle-aged, and had a large, bushy moustache. His hair was jet black, in spite of his years, though his age was obvious from the deep lines etched across his face. The other was slimmer and looked to be younger, with shoulder-length brown hair and some light stubble. Mrs. Thelma Bay? The younger man asked, looking directly at my mother. Um, yes, she stammered. I'm Detective Roy Prescott. This is Detective John Wilkinson. We're here about a murder, he said, raising an eyebrow. We'd like to speak with you in private, ma'am, if you don't mind. He spoke politely, but forcefully. Something told me that when he said, if you don't mind, he meant it as a command. If mum truly did mind, it was hard to imagine that anything would change. The detectives took her aside to have a private conversation about what was happening. They were interrupted by the arrival of a white vehicle. Five people dressed in blue plastic and carrying equipment hurried inside the house. The younger man, Detective Wilkinson, went inside the house with them. The rest of us shuffled about awkwardly while we waited for the detectives and mum to return. Nobody spoke, presumably for the same reason I didn't. There wasn't anything to talk about but awkward conversation or extremely strange questions that nobody wanted to ask or possibly even wanted answers to. After what felt like hours, but was probably about 15 minutes, 
Detective Prescott and Mum came back to our group. Prescott appeared to be exasperated and was rubbing his temples furiously. I could relate. Mum looked somewhat put out, though I imagined that was normal for someone who was being questioned over a murder. This man told me over and over again that I can't go to the Gold Coast tomorrow. Then he asked me a lot of stupid questions, Mum said in an exhausted tone. Is that all? Not quite, I'm afraid. Prescott sighed and then nodded to Wilkinson, who had just returned. I know I asked you before, Mrs. Bay, but we're still unclear on one point. You hired this escort, yes? Mum nodded enthusiastically. Yes, I did. If you don't mind me saying so, Wilkinson paused to clear his throat. It's unusual for a good church-going lady like yourself to partake in something so, um, um. Clearly, words had failed him. I just needed him to help me, since Pastor Green wouldn't, Mum said as she stabbed her finger angrily in the direction of the upset pastor. The detectives looked at each other and raised their eyebrows but said nothing for a moment. Did you, uh, partake of his services? Prescott asked after a long silence. Mum sighed. I didn't really have a chance, did I? I had planned to, of course. I had planned out the entire thing, down to each detail. I just needed him to hop in the car and help get me there. Okay, that's more than enough information on that, Wilkinson interjected, much to our collective relief. What happened when he arrived? Well, I was understandably nervous, as I'd never hired an escort before. People have recommended those automatic machines, but technology's hard to grasp for somebody my age, Mum explained, nodding and smiling politely, while Wilkinson did his best to hide his disgust. Oh, I didn't know we were having naked, impeccably muscular guests, a familiar voice piped up. I turned to see Ernie standing nearby, rubbing his chin. Why a ghost would need to rub his chin was beyond me, though I supposed it was merely a habit. Ignoring him for a reason, he asked me, or can't you see him? Perhaps he needs to try harder. Of course, neither of us could say anything, given the company we were in. It was bad enough to have a naked ghost wildly flailing about in an attempt to get our attention, but having Ernie here to fuel him on was only making it worse. Shoot yourselves, Ernie said with a shrug. Ian suddenly spoke up. It's not quite what you think. You see, Thelma was asking Pastor Green and me for help, but Pastor Green was obviously far too busy, and I have a girlfriend, so we recommended one of the car-mounted ones. His tone was entirely smug, as if his statement had made sense of the entire matter. Wilkinson and Prescott looked shocked, and Ian was seemingly unaware of what he was saying. Unfortunately, he continued, Well, as Thelma said, she's not one for technology, so she needed something more hands-on, so to speak. Since she never managed to get there with the machine, she wanted somebody to get her there in person. That's enough, Prescott said firmly, exchanging a shocked glance with Wilkinson. How did you hire him, Mrs. Bay? I asked a nice lady I saw downtown standing next to a trailer if she knew where I could get a good escort. She recommended Tom's agency. She said they were expensive, but worth the extra cost. I called the office number she gave me, though the office lady was a little confused at first. Mum explained hesitantly, clearly trying hard to think back to what happened. Why is that? Wilkinson asked, making copious notes in a notepad. When I asked her if Tom was good with directions, she said that he would get me to the big O. But of course, I didn't want to go all the way to America to see Oprah. I just wanted to go for a road trip, Mum said simply, to the Gold Coast. I beg your pardon, Prescott asked. I'm a bit lost. I bet it was one of the theologians who killed him, Mum suddenly announced, hands held high. 
I have six people staying in the spare rooms here, so it's obviously one of them. Though why they'd kill poor Tom, I have no idea. Theologians, Wilkinson and Prescott shared a glance. What are they doing here? Yes, that's the question, isn't it? Thelma snapped. I thought that they were here to seek the Holy Spirit. Aren't we all? Ian interjected with a sanctimonious smile. Yes, quite so. Mum smiled too. Well, no, I suppose not these six. They're looking for regular, non-holy ghosts. They're ghost hunters, Wilkinson asked. They write about ghosts, Mum said sadly. I had to let them stay, because the good book says not to turn away a stranger. That is, in the King James Bible, of course. Goodness knows what the Amplified Bible says, she added in abject disgust. God only wrote one Bible, the King James Bible, not those dreadful modern versions that twist his words. The detectives looked at each other. Prescott ran his hands through his hair as Wilkinson let out a long, pained sigh. Okay, we have a dead escort, writers but not theologians, and mental imagery that will haunt us to our dying days. Is there anything else? Mum shook her head. Then we'll get underway. Thank you for your help, Mrs. Bay, he said to Mum, though I somehow doubted he was sincere. Now I'll ask everyone to move into Mrs. Bay's house while we question you all. Chapter Four The detectives were efficient. They told us all to sit in Mum's living room and said they would call us one by one. They calmly explained the situation, saying that they were going to question us each privately, and then we would be free to go. Basil was still outside, speaking to Duncan. The detectives took Pastor Green and Mum with them first. I wondered why they took both of them when they said they were going to question us individually, especially as Pastor Green had not been in the vicinity when the murder happened. Then I had a light bulb moment. They wanted Pastor Green to translate for Mum to explain mum to them. Good luck with that. I had no sooner sat down than Ian shuffled over to me. Why don't you make all our guests a cup of tea, dear? He said in a patronizing tone. Ian, if I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times not to call me dear. You're not much older than I am. I must have said it more loudly than I had intended because the guests looked at me with shocked expressions on their faces. I took orders and then hurried to the butler's pantry to make everyone some coffee. Mum was having her kitchen remodelled, and her first act had been to have a butler's pantry installed. Her idea was that she could continue to cook while the rest of the kitchen was being remodelled. I thought it was rather strange that she had taken in paying guests before the kitchen had been done, and I wondered why she had an oven and cooktop in the butler's pantry while the very same appliances were to be in the new kitchen itself. Still, there was no point trying to have a logical conversation with her, so I had held my tongue about the whole thing. I passed the long-suffering Bryce Wilson, the builder doing the renovation. You've heard about the murder victim, I asked in passing, and then realized I was talking about it as though it were an everyday occurrence. He put his tube of silicon down and looked at me. Yes, he grunted. I hope your mother saved his soul first, or he'll be descending straight to hell to a lake of fire and brimstone. With that, he turned back to his work. I rolled my eyes. Bryce was from Mum's church, which was the only reason she had him working for her. His prices were exorbitant, but Mum's sole requirement for tradespersons was they attended her church. The only reason I felt sorry for him was that Mum kept changing her renovation plans and he also had to endure the painful process of explaining renovation terms to her. Would you like a cup of tea? I asked him. Or some coffee? The police are questioning everyone in turn, so I'm making tea and coffee for all the guests. No thanks, he muttered without turning around. I walked past him into the butler's pantry to make coffee for everyone. I put some cookies on a plate and passed them around after I allocated the drinks, trying to distract myself. I found it hard to come to terms with the fact that someone had been murdered in my mother's house, 
and in her bedroom at that. It was all horribly disturbing, to say the least. I sure hoped the detectives were efficient and discovered whoever it was. If it wasn't her holier-than-thou builder friend, then it had to be one of the guests, and that put my nerves on edge. They were all still under Mum's roof. As I walked out, I stared at them. Three couples, who would have thought that one or more of them could be murderers? Bradley and Beck Musgrave were artistic types, both potters. They were retired, but I had no idea what their respective professions had been. They were brightly dressed, Bradley less so, but they both had the air of an artist about them. Robert and Louise Quinn were retired school teachers and looked pleasant enough. They were more conservatively dressed. And then there were the two who were more talkative than the others, James and Jenny Thoroughgood. They had not yet retired. James was a therapist and Jenny was in retail. What possible motive could any one of them have to kill an escort? No sooner had I taken my seat than Mum and Pastor Green emerged. I'm not allowed to speak to anyone, she announced dramatically. The detectives told Pastor Green to stop me speaking until after they had spoken to everyone. I suppressed a smile. The poor man had already failed in his duty. I handed him a cookie by way of compensation and asked if he'd like some coffee. He said that he would, and I was on my way back to the butler's pantry when Basil forestalled me. I'll make it, Laurel. You sit down. Thanks, Basil. I didn't even see you come inside. I just got here. I was speaking to Duncan. He walked in the direction of the kitchen while I sat down once more, this time next to Jenny Thoroughgood. Detective Wilkinson poked his head around the corner and called to James. He stood up quickly and hurried into the room. Jenny watched after him as he left, looking nervous, though I assumed that was normal enough, given that her spouse was being questioned for murder and she was next. Do you know how he was killed? She asked me. I shook my head. Not a clue. How was it? Ian asked the pastor, who looked more than a little put out. What exactly did they ask you? The pastor's face flushed beet red and he stammered for a moment. They asked me a bit more about the area, local history and such. I'm sure they knew most of it, so I can only assume I was being quizzed to see if I was exactly who I claimed I am. They don't believe that you're a pastor, but so many of us can account for you, Ian said. Pastor Green shrugged. I don't know. I couldn't really make sense of it all, but I suppose it's good that I'm not used to questions about murder. He laughed half-heartedly. It was abundantly clear to me that the pastor did not want to explain to all and sundry that he had been called in simply to make sense of Mum's replies. Why would they ask you about the local area? Ian said loudly. It seems more likely that they were asking for a different reason. Did you preach to them, Pastor Green? Did you invite them to our church? If that poor wicked man had seen the light, now he wouldn't be burning in hell caused by his own damnation. Mum agreed. Yes, and without a stitch on. Well, that will teach Satan. How? I said before I could stop myself. Even Satan would be embarrassed by a naked man, Mum explained. Ian disagreed. No, Thelma, Satan is the cause of all nakedness. Oh, yes, you're right, Ian. Mum was clearly not offended by Ian's reprimand. Silly me. Yes, the Bible says to put on clothes of righteousness. She nodded sagely. Chapter 5 The rest of us sat in nervous silence for several minutes. I was at a total loss for words, wondering what the questions were going to be about. I assumed they were mostly going to ask me about Mum and the six guests, although given that I was in a nearby building when the murder occurred, I could just as easily be a suspect. Finally, James came back, looking relatively relieved, but before he had a chance to speak to Jenny, Wilkinson called her to the room. What did they talk to you about? Basil asked James, clearly not afraid not to beat around the bush. James sighed and cleared his throat. 
They asked me why Jenny and I were here. I talked about our work for a while. And then they started asking more personal questions, like how long we've been together and if our marriage is a happy one. What did you say? Ian asked, seemingly unaware or uncaring whether or not the question was appropriate. James shrugged before replying. I told them the truth. Everything is fine. I'm not even really sure how those questions were relevant. They were wondering if James or Jenny had some past relationship with the victim, I realized, but decided not to say anything. Did they ask you anything else? I asked, hoping to get some sense of what the questioning was about. I assumed it would all be quite straightforward, but there was no sense in not learning as much as I possibly could. Things you'd expect, really, James said. They asked about my therapy work, though they didn't press me too much on that subject. They asked where I was at certain times, if I knew the victim, and so on. It wasn't exactly gruelling, though it's harder than I thought it would be to recall when and where I was at a specific time. I sighed, worried that maybe the detectives would interview everybody else first, and I would be stuck there, worrying for what would feel like hours until they finally got to me. Even though I knew I was innocent, I was nervous about being questioned. I figured it was like driving past a police officer and suddenly worrying that I was speeding, even though I already knew I wasn't. Jenny came back before long, and Robert was called up next. We asked Jenny about her experience, though it was unsurprisingly similar to James's explanation. The detectives had asked her what she did for a living, where she had been all morning, and what her relationship with James was like. It seemed to me that the relationship questions were a matter of figuring out whether or not somebody would have had reason to hire an escort, which could then lead to further questioning about a possible grudge. It seemed likely one of the guests was the murderer of the deceased escort, who, I might add, was still floating around in a nude state. Robert returned, and then Louise was up, with Bradley following. They all reported the same experience. They were asked about their relationships, the stories they were writing about ghosts, their alibi, and so on. It all seemed to be quite standard, which made me think that the detectives did not consider any of them to be prime suspects. Then again, it was possible that one of the guests was lying about the questions they had been asked, so as to avoid suspicion from the rest of us. Mrs. Musgrave, Detective Prescott said flatly. Beck stood up wordlessly and followed him into the study. Mind helping me outside for a moment, Laurel? Basil asked, raising an eyebrow. Oh, um, no, I said, wondering what could be happening. Basil nodded slightly, and I looked over to see Ernie beckoning to us, his head stuck through the front door. I closed the door behind us and then walked around the edge of the building where we wouldn't be overheard and sighed loudly. This hasn't been a great day. I admitted, rubbing my temples. What did... Before I could finish, the ghost of the victim appeared, still entirely nude. Oh, jeez, Basil said, looking away suddenly. Would you put some clothes on? Ernie, please ask him to put some pants on at least, I asked, covering my eyes. What's wrong? Can't bear it, Ernie asked, clearly more amused than he had any right to be. Please, no puns. I pleaded, just ask him. Ernie shrugged. Can you put some pants on, naked gun? Maybe a shirt, too? The ghost vanished for a full minute before returning fully clothed. Thank you, I said, relieved. I'm not sure why that took you so long. The ghost was silent for a moment. I wasn't really sure about the logistics of clothes now that I'm, you know, well, how I am. You're quite dead, Basil said, though he sounded more sympathetic than his simple phrasing suggested. Yes, I suppose I am. The victim looked down at himself. Anyway, I'm glad I can talk to you. You're not ghosts, are you? How is it you can communicate with me? With us, he added, looking at Ernie. It's a long story, and the detectives are going to be back any moment, I said, hoping to instill a sense of urgency. We need to ask you a couple of questions quickly. 
The ghost nodded. Did you see who killed you, Tom? Basil asked, going straight to the most important question. No, the ghost responded simply, but my name's not Tom, it's Frank, Frank Wright. Right, I said, then mentally kicked myself. What's the last thing you remember? I asked him. I was in the room with my back to the door, Frank said. Somebody came inside. I heard the door opening, you see, and I just assumed it was Thelma. That was the last thing I heard. You don't remember anything else? I asked, stifling a frustrated sigh. No, it's not that. I remember with perfect clarity. It's not that I've forgotten, but that was the last thing that happened to me. The ghost clarified. Frankly, I think you're right, Ernie said. Basil and I groaned. We'd better get back, I said to Basil before turning to the ghost. Thanks, we'll talk later. Meanwhile, try to think of anyone with a reason to kill you. Lots of people had a reason to kill me, Frank said in rather too pleased a tone. Boyfriends? Husbands? Did you have a wife or a girlfriend? I asked him. Frank vanished. Basil and I hurried back to the living room. Wilkinson was poking his head around the corner. When he spotted me, he said, follow me. Basil gave me a warm, reassuring smile. My heartbeat quickened as I followed the detectives down the hallway to the study. Please take a seat, Detective Prescott said. I did as he suggested, feeling immensely uncomfortable. I wondered what kind of questions they were going to ask. How can I help? I asked nervously. We mostly wanted to ask you about your mother, Prescott said. Has she always been so, well, religiously zealous? Yes, she's an extremely religious person, I admitted. I thought it was best to be honest, since she was innocent, though I had to be careful to make her sound harmless. She told us that she thought the victim was called Tom, and that he was a kind of literal escort, as in a form of GPS, like a guide, Wilkinson said with an eyebrow raised. That's exactly what happened, I admitted. I kept telling her to get a tom-tom, and I think she thought that I was stuttering. I don't know if she's ever heard the term escort in any other sense. Where were you at the time the victim was killed? Prescott asked, leaning forward. I don't know when he was killed exactly, I pointed out, wondering if this was some sort of trap. I was doing paperwork all morning in the funeral home. Did anyone see you? I shook my head. I don't think so. And had you ever met the escort previously? I shook my head again. No, and I didn't even know of his existence until mum called and said he was dead. I thought she meant her GPS had failed her. Wilkinson and Prescott exchanged glances. This couldn't be good. Chapter 6 Are you sure you don't want some help? Basil asked, with more than a little hint of concern to his voice. Of course not. You have to get to work. I appreciated the gesture, even if it was unlikely that Basil actually had the time to help. Besides, I'm nearly done. Basil looked around the room with his eyebrows raised. What exactly is the theme this time? He asked, confounded. Gold? I frowned. Pretty much. For whatever reason, the widow of the deceased has requested, and more importantly, actually handsomely paid for, a Donald Trump-themed funeral. Oh, Basil said with a chuckle. That's, um, different. And what's this then? He asked, pointing to a large piece of painted foam leaning against the wall. I exhaled loudly. That's part of the wall. Mum and Ian have decided that a gigantic wall one covered in scriptures, no less, will sit in the aisle and separate the guests. Why? Basil asked, exactly as confused as any sane person ought to be. Don't ask me, I said with a shrug. We're trying to talk her out of it, but it's not really up to us. Pastor Green and I, that is. It gets worse, too, but I won't waste any more of your time with details. You've got to get to work. Basil checked his watch. It's not so urgent, but I'll have to leave in a minute. Before you go then, do you mind talking about the murder a bit? 
I asked. I know it's not really the time or place, but I've been thinking about it a lot. Of course not, he said. Besides, a funeral home seems a fine place to talk about murder, or as fine as any place, at least. What's on your mind? I think that the murderer would have to be one of Mum's guests, I explained. It's just that I don't have a clue as to which one. Or I suppose it could have even been more than one of them. Come to think of it, it could have been all of them, just like on Murder on the Orient Express. Basil patted my shoulder. I'm sure they're looking into it. I don't know if Basil knew the effect his touch had on me. It took me a moment before I was able to speak. I'm sure the detectives suspect the guests, but Mum would have to be a suspect too. I suppose so. Anyway, I'd better get going, Basil said as he glanced at his watch once more. Try not to worry. I'll see you later. He kissed me politely on the cheek, much to my dismay, before hurrying off to do mathematics and filing, or whatever accountants do. I turned back to face the bizarre decorations and scratched my head. I'd attended some truly awful themed funerals in the past, but this had to be one of the strangest. Either way, it was far too late to turn back now. The funeral was on in about an hour, and I had nearly finished setting everything up. He looks awful, a voice from behind me said angrily. Who? I asked, spinning around. Basil? Janet laughed. Of course not. Basil looks fine. Better than fine. Even better than John Jones. I mean the corpse. Well, don't most corpses look awful? I asked, somewhat bewildered. I was also bewildered that she liked John Jones, a particularly unpleasant friend of Mum's, a man who had developed a crush on me. It seems a normal thing for a corpse to do, possibly the only normal thing one should expect from a corpse. I mean, he looked awful after I finished applying the makeup, which is a first. Have you seen him? Janet asked, crossing her arms. Um, no, I admitted, and I don't think I want to go out of my way to do so. I don't know if you noticed, Janet, but he's a corpse. That is something I'd prefer to avoid seeing. Normally I'd disagree, but this time you're probably right about not wanting to see him, Janet said. Well, I've done my job, even if I hated it. How are you doing? I managed to talk Mum out of handing out toupees, but otherwise she hasn't budged on some of her ideas. Even the wall? Janet asked with a worried tone. I nodded and her face fell. Well, you should see the body if you think that's bad. I took the bait. All right, what did you have to do? Why should I see him? Her expression turned deathly serious before she spoke. I had to dress him to look just like Donald Trump. You're kidding, I said flatly, though I already knew she wasn't. It was only as insane as everything else about the funeral. Down to every detail? Janet looked horror-stricken. Every detail, yes. It was a nightmare to find a suitable wig, though I managed it in the end, if barely. I sighed and walked over to look in the casket. Janet! Why did you spray paint him gold? I said in alarm. Janet appeared to be on the point of crying. Widow's wishes, as you should know. That's a spray tan. It was in the notes. She stopped speaking for a moment. Did you hear that? I nodded. Loud voices sounded from the entrance. We simply can't do it, Thelma, Pastor Green said sternly as he walked into the room with Mum and Ian in tow. It's not ethical practical or moral. I'm sorry you've already paid for the bricks, but I simply don't think you can do it. Mum thought for a minute before replying. But it's a Trump-themed funeral, she said flatly. You know how much he likes walls. Besides, we've already bought the bricks for the wall. We just need to build it. We need the heathens on one side of the wall, she looked at me as she said it, and those of us who are righteous on the other. I agree with Pastor Green, I interjected, hoping that we could sway her before it came to a confrontation. Don't you think it's a bad idea to separate all the people who have come to pay their respects? But it's covered in scriptures, Ian said, as if that would somehow make it all okay. Maybe you're right, Mum said, much to my shock. 
If we have the wall, then it will be harder for people to see everything else we've set up. I looked around at the bizarre Trump-inspired decorations and resisted the urge to argue. Plus, we can hand up the foam bricks as gifts, she continued. Pastor Green and I shared a glance. I decided it would be wise not to say anything. It seemed the lesser of two evils. Oh, it looks wonderful, dear, Ian said earnestly. It captures his presence perfectly. I looked around at the bright orange, black, and gold decorations and shrugged lightly. Don't call me dear, but thanks, I said. Mr. Trump is such a wonderful man, Ian continued. It's an inspiration to hold a funeral in his honor. Pastor Green raised an eyebrow. The funeral isn't in his honor. It's just a theme, Mum beamed. All the same, I think it's very exciting, isn't it, Ian? Ian readily agreed. As a group, we made short work of the rest of the decorations. We set up the model White House and the Trump action figures in no time. I must say, I had been surprised to find such a thing as a Trump action figure, and in Australia, no less. Before long, attendants shuffled in and took their pre-assigned seats. It was an open casket funeral, and the casket itself had been spray-painted bright gold and covered in gold glitter. Once everybody was seated comfortably, Pastor Green took the stage, looking strangely nervous. He'd been at dozens of funerals, even at his relatively young age, so I wasn't sure what was wrong. Had something happened that I didn't know about? He cleared his throat and turned to face the casket. He pointed to it dramatically and yelled, You're fired! There was a silence so thick you could feel it. I stared at the widow, and to my surprise, she was nodding happily. It must have been another one of her bizarre requests. I had to wonder what sort of person requested that. I also wondered how the rest of the mourners felt, though looking around it was hard to tell, as everybody was stony-faced. Pastor Green spoke for a short while before introducing the first speaker and then hurrying to his seat. I had always thought that a happy funeral was preferable to a sad one for obvious reasons, though it was obviously something that was harder to manage in practice. I thought that perhaps funerals were more fun if people did not like the deceased. If that were true, this dead man hadn't been very popular, as most eulogies contained jokes at his expense. At the end of the service, everybody moved to the ante room where we served tea, coffee, and cookies. Everybody accepted a scripture brick from Mum and Ian on their way from the chapel. Pastor Green was fidgeting. I figured he was still embarrassed about having to say you're fired at the beginning of the service. As I walked past a group of mourners, I heard a voice demand, Do you know where you will spend eternity? I spun around. And sure enough, John Jones was harassing an elderly lady. John, can I have a word with you, please? He followed me to a quiet corner of the room. Did you know the deceased? I snapped at him. He shook his head. Then you'll need to leave now. You have no right harassing mourners. John's expression turned sullen. Thelma invited me. This is not a party, John. This is a funeral service. And if you're going to harass mourners, then I'll call the police. This is a serious matter. So is going to hell, John said firmly. I've just been asking people when they last went to church. Excuse me for trying to save some souls. Save your breath, John, I said angrily. Either keep your mouth shut or leave right now. If I catch you harassing anyone again, I will call the police. This is not an idle threat. It's easy to see why you think you can have authority over a man, John said, since you're wearing men's clothing. The Bible says women should not dress like men. It also says people are not allowed to wear two different fabrics at once. I touched the edge of his suit. This looks to me to be more than one fabric, John. You're in danger of going to hell for this, according to your reasoning. John turned a deathly shade of white and ran his hand through his comb over. His mouth opened and shut in a good imitation of a goldfish. I walked over to the refreshment table and selected the most fat-laden cookie on display. Ernie appeared suddenly and without warning. Laurel, it's urgent.
Chapter 7 I dropped my cookie. Are you okay? Pastor Green shot me a worried look. Oh, yes, I said, glaring at Ernie. I just remembered something. I'll be back in a second. I walked to my office, noting that Janet was talking to John Jones. How she found that man attractive, even pleasant, was beyond me. Ernie followed me closely, staying mercifully silent. How's the new ghost? I asked once I was in my office, figuring that was the problem. Frank's not handling the afterlife. He's okay, other than being dead, Ernie said. But Laurel, he can't move on until the murderer is found. I sighed. I'm fully aware of that. It's a common ghost problem, as common as ghost-specific problems can get anyway. Can you hurry up and find the murderer? Ernie pleaded. He's very, very annoying. You wouldn't believe how annoying a ghost can be. I have a pretty good idea, I thought. Aloud, I said. If solving murders was easy, we wouldn't have detectives. And that's the point. We do have detectives, so I'm leaving the detecting up to them. Speaking of which, I have bad news, Ernie said, his voice once more taking on an urgent tone. What is it? I asked, swallowing nervously. It wasn't like Ernie to act seriously, so whatever it was, it couldn't be good. I overheard the detectives speaking, Ernie explained. Laurel, they blame Thelma. They think your mother did it. I was relieved. Don't worry, Ernie. It's only natural they'd see her as a suspect. He was killed in her bedroom, after all. Ernie hovered over to me. Not a suspect, Laurel. The suspect. They're going to pin it on her. They said that nobody could be that strange and that she's playing it up to appear as though she isn't fit to plead. That is, they think she's acting in Shane instead of simply being in Shane. I was at a total loss for words. But why would Mum murder somebody? I asked, my voice barely a squeak. Ernie held his hands in the air. Da, they think she's a religious zealot. They now realize she actually did hire him to escort her somewhere, but now they think she murdered him when she found out just what kind of escort he really is. Or was, I suppose, depending on whether you believe in ghosts or not. As a ghost, I do. I fixed him with a stern look. You're not joking. This is for real? Ernie nodded. Yes, they said there's no use looking at anybody else. They said it's obvious that Thelma's the murderer. Besides, she did have those hats with hat pins in them. They just want to wrap this up and then get out of town. I heard them with my very own ears. I had no idea what to make of all this, but unfortunately it added up. Now it was clear I would have to track down the killer and do so before the police arrested my mother for a crime she did not commit. Wait a moment. What do hat pins have to do with it? The murder weapon, of course. Frank was murdered by a hat pin. Ernie burst into laughter. Frankly, I have no idea if that's right. The police took all your mother's hideous hats, though. I shot him a withering glare. Stop saying that. It wasn't even funny the first time. Ernie shrugged one shoulder. You know what this means, don't you? Before I could answer, he continued. You have to solve the murder unless you want your mother to go to prison. He raised his eyebrows. Come to think of it, it mightn't be such a bad idea. At least you'd get some peace. I thought it a tempting idea, if only for a moment, if I were to be honest. No, I can't have mum going to prison for a crime she didn't commit, I said firmly and somewhat regretfully. Just then Frank appeared. Thank goodness you still have your clothes on, I said by way of greeting. No one's ever complained before, he said with a wink. I rolled my eyes. Still in the business, I see. Well, your flirting won't get you anywhere with me. Not only am I alive and you're not, but I have a, um, my voice trailed away. Boyfriend, Ernie supplied. I didn't know if Basil was officially my boyfriend. I supposed he was, but he had not said as much. While I was hesitating, Frank sidled up to me. Most of my clients had boyfriends, 
husbands even. I held up my hand. I don't want to know. What I do want to know is if you recognize any of the guests. And I'm grateful I have wards around my apartment so ghosts can't get in, I added silently. Guests, he said. Ernie groaned and put his head in his hands. To be frank, this is going to be difficult. Ernie, I snapped. And Frank, were you married? The ghost flickered. No. Did you have a girlfriend? Frank stared at the ground. I took that as an affirmative. What's her name? Frank hovered upwards. She had nothing to do with it. I shook my head. Why were ghosts always so difficult? Please just tell me her name. If you say she didn't have anything to do with your murder, then it won't matter, will it? Frank's image faded. Mandy, Mandy Major. She had nothing to do with it, though. Thank you. Frank, there are six guests staying in Mum's house. I want you to go to the house and take a long, hard look at each of them. And while you're at it, Mum has a builder working in her kitchen. Get a good look at him, too. See if you recognize any of them, and then report back to me. Frank nodded and then vanished, thankfully followed by Ernie. I went back to join the others. I headed straight for Mum and drew her aside. Mum, where did you have those old hats of yours with the hat pins in them? You used to have them on the hat stand downstairs in the laundry room. Oh, those? Mum waved her hand dismissively. Yes, that's where they still are, or where the hat stand is. The police confiscated the hats and hat pins, she said as an afterthought. They did, I said loudly. Shush, Mum snapped. What will people think? Why did they do that? I said in lowered tones. Not because they wanted to wear them to church, Mum said waspishly. They took them to help in their investigations. You're an intelligent girl, Laurel. Surely you could have figured that out for yourself. I took a deep breath. Perhaps I could let her go to prison after all. The idea was beginning to be appealing. Just when I thought things couldn't get any worse, I was enveloped in a tight hug. When I finally managed to extricate myself, I looked up into the flushed face of John Jones. What are you doing? I snapped. Hug me again and I'll have you arrested. Don't be so rude to John, my mother admonished me. My dearest wish is that you and John marry. Hell would freeze over first, I snapped. Mum's jaw fell open. Laurel, you said the H word. I can say whatever I like, Mum. This is my funeral home, and if you and John can't behave, you'll have to leave. I've already given John one warning. Mum and John clutched each other, but before they could speak, Ian appeared and handed me a foam brick. Laurel, you should take notice of the good word written on the brick. I wished I hadn't accepted the brick, but I suppose it's instinct to take something when handed it. I read it aloud. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Mark chapter 12, verse 31. Mum, Ian, and John said in unison. Their collective tones were overly sanctimonious. Hang on a moment, I'm missing something, I said. This is written on one of the bricks you were going to place on the wall between the mourners, between what you called the heathens and the righteous. The three of them nodded happily. Chapter 8 I was sitting in Tara's favorite cafe in the main street in town. If I were to be precise, it was really the only street in town. It was a warm day, but the breeze provided pleasant relief, as did the shade of the tree under which I was sitting, swatting at pesky flies. Tara had been my best friend since high school, and when I had left to go to university in Melbourne, Tara and I had kept in close touch. Tara had married Duncan, now the local police sergeant, and today I wanted information from Tara about the murder weapon. I had already told her this when I had invited her for coffee, and she didn't seem to mind, although I did not want to put her in an awkward position. I was thinking on this and didn't see her arrive. Laurel, I squealed. My hands flew to my throat. I didn't see you, Tara laughed. Obviously, she sat beside me. 
Should we be sitting out here with all the flies or inside? Up to you, but there are probably as many flies inside as there are out. Tara put her purse on the ground. You're probably right. Anyway, do I have some news for you? I was intrigued. What is it? Have you found out what the murder weapon was? Tara waved a hand in dismissal. No, not yet. She was going to say more, but I interrupted her. Mum finally told me that the police confiscated her hats and hat pins. A strange look passed across Tara's face. If it does turn out to be one of the hat pins in your mother's house, it doesn't mean anything. The house was full of people, so they shouldn't think it was your mother more than anyone else. Tara's words tumbled out one after the other. What aren't you telling me, Tara? She fidgeted in her seat. Unfortunately, the waitress chose that very moment to place our coffees in front of us. Oh, you already ordered, Tara said. Yes, I got the usual. You didn't want something different, did you? Before she could answer, I pressed on. What were you going to tell me? Tara swatted flies for what seemed like a full minute before answering me. Laurel, I'm sure it's nothing to worry about, but Duncan said the detectives suspect Thelma. Is it just because of her, um, personality? Tara stared at her spoon. Yes, I'm afraid so. They think she's acting like it deliberately so she can avoid prison by being not fit to plead. I didn't want to tell you this, but you always said you'd rather know, no matter how bad it was. I nodded. I had my hand clamped over the top of my latte so the flies couldn't dive bomb it. I really do appreciate you telling me. Yes, I'd always rather know. I just don't want to put you in an awkward position with Duncan. Tara smiled. Leave Duncan to me. Anyway, I can't wait to tell you what I found out. It's about your mother. I looked into my latte. I don't think anything you could say about my mother could surprise me. Don't bet on it, Tara said. Have you ever heard about the narcissist mother and the scapegoat daughter? I was puzzled. Is that some kind of Disney film or something? Tara nearly choked on her latte. No, silly, she said when she had recovered. I was just watching YouTube, and I came across something on the narcissist mother and a scapegoat daughter. Sometimes there's a golden child as well, but since you're the only child, you're it, the scapegoat. It explains exactly how your mother is. You should Google it. It's absolutely amazing. Some scapegoat daughters end up having to have absolutely no contact with the narcissist mother. I can certainly relate to that, I said seriously. Thanks for the heads up. I'll Google it when I have time. You'll see. It will put her behavior into perspective. Apparently, it's quite common. I had to laugh. I thought I was the only one to have a mother like that. Anyway, back to the detectives suspecting mum. Ernie already told me that, but he isn't always the most reliable source. Tara, could you please do a spell to help the police find the real murderer? Tara and Basil were the only two people who knew I could see ghosts. Of course, Basil could see them too, but Tara couldn't. Tara practiced witchcraft. She was a solitary, that is to say, she wasn't in a coven. Tara's expression turned solemn. I'm already on it. As much as I don't like your mother, no offense, I wouldn't want to see her go to prison for a crime she didn't commit. James and Jenny Thoroughgood walked into the courtyard, smiling at me, before they took a seat under the shade of a tree on the other side of the courtyard. They were sitting with their backs to me, but were in full view of Tara. Now, see that couple who just walked in? I said in hushed tones. That's James and Jenny Thoroughgood. There are another four people staying with mum, and the seventh suspect is that guy who's building mum's kitchen. He's from her church. Tara snorted. Of course he is. Your mother only hires people from her church, even if they're not qualified for what they're doing. Remember the time she got that electrician who didn't have a license to change her fittings, and it blew the power in half the town? I put my hands over my eyes. At least the builder's definitely qualified. He charges her a fortune, but he does have a lot to put up with. Tara readily agreed. Mm, you certainly can't begrudge him his money. He sure earns it. 
I couldn't speak for a moment because some children ran past our table yelling and hitting each other. Basil and I are going to look into the suspects. We have to find the motive. If the police aren't going to do it, then we'll have to. Tara leant across the table. Be careful. Anyway, would you like cake? I groaned. Well, now that you mention it, I was going to try to resist. Tara stood up. I'll go in order now. Do you want to come in too so you can choose? I shook my head. No, just choose something you think I'll like. Nothing healthy like a carrot cake or anything. Something really bad for me would be nice. Tara laughed. After she left, I leant back in my chair, enjoying the cool breeze as it carried the fragrance of eucalyptus trees to me. Laurel. I opened my eyes to see John Jones sitting opposite me. I had heard someone approach, but assumed it was Tara. What are you doing here? I said, none too kindly. I saw you sitting here and I didn't think you wanted to be alone, he said, winking at me. I resisted the urge to vomit, only with some difficulty. I'm not alone. I'm with my friend Tara, and she's just gone inside to order more food. Why don't I join you? I shook my head. No, John, Tara and I wish to speak in private. We want to be alone. John's hand flew to his mouth. You're not Olympians, are you? He said. At least I think that's what he said, given that it was hard to hear him with his hand over his mouth. No, of course we're not Olympians, I said. You know that? I was entirely puzzled, but I think he had been hanging out with my mother so much that she had rubbed off on him. Still, for the life of me, I couldn't figure out what he meant by Olympians. Oh, that's such a relief, John said. You had me worried there, Laurel. If you were an Olympian, then we could never date. We cannot and will not ever date, John Jones, I said angrily. You need to stop harassing me. Remember, thou shalt not covet another man's girlfriend. Hezekiah chapter 3 verse 1. John looked horror-stricken. Did you make that up? Mercifully, Tara returned at that point and shooed John from the chair. He walked away, looking back over his shoulder at me. I don't know why Janet doesn't just invite him out and get it over with, Tara said. I sighed sadly. Janet wants him to ask her. I think he only has eyes for you, Laurel. I held up a hand in protest. Ooh. Anyway, what did you order for me? Tara smiled. A white chocolate blueberry pie. What did you say to John Jones? I pretty much told him to go and said I had a boyfriend. Tara looked contemplative. What exactly is the boyfriend situation? I wish I knew, I said, holding up my hands. We've kissed, but we haven't exactly talked about it. Tara giggled. There's nothing to worry about. Basil adores you, Laurel, I shrugged. Why hasn't he come out and made things clear? It's a progression, I suppose, she said thoughtfully. He has a lot of things going on at the moment, what with being a new millionaire and all. He isn't one yet, I pointed out. He has to wait until probate's through, and that will be months. Give him time, Tara said. Basil's friend was recently murdered while he was parachuting with him, and then Basil found out he was the sole heir. He was even arrested. There's nothing wrong between you, is there? Oh no, nothing like that, I hastened to add. Like I said, we've kissed, and we hang out together and stuff. I just hope... My voice trailed away. You're worrying about nothing. Men don't kiss their friends. I thought for a moment before speaking. It's just, well... Basil seems the ideal man. I wonder if he's too good to be true. And we've kissed, but sometimes he just kisses me on the cheek. Tara smiled impishly. And you want more? I shook my head. No. Well, yes, of course I do. I don't want to rush into anything, but I don't like the fact that he isn't rushing into anything. I know I'm not making any sense. Sure you are. Tara said. That's how I was with Duncan at first. Just don't stress. Give it time. It'll all work out. I sure hope you're right, I said, and then changed the subject. Anyway, 
Do you know Mandy Major? Yes, as a matter of fact, she does my eyebrows, Tara said. She's a beauty therapist at Tari and comes to town twice a month to do facials, eyebrows and stuff. She hasn't taken on new clients for ages, though. Why? She was the victim's girlfriend. Tara's hand flew to her mouth. Oh, no. The poor thing. I tapped my chin. What if she killed Frank? What if she didn't know he was an escort and then followed him to Mum's house? The waitress deposited our cakes in front of us. I don't think that's possible, Tara said as soon as the waitress was out of earshot. There were the six guests, your mother and the builder. Surely somebody would have seen someone who wasn't meant to be there. Chapter 9 I was somewhat downhearted after I returned home from having coffee with Tara. It wasn't just the fact that she had not yet discovered what the murder weapon was. It was also my chance meeting with John Jones. Even then, I couldn't be sure that the meeting was entirely by chance. He was turning into something of a stalker. Although I should have been attending to paperwork, I was trying to arrange the sprinkler hose across the roses and other flowers at the front of the funeral home. It had been unseasonably hot lately, and even some of the native bottle brush bushes were looking wilted. No matter which way I faced the hose, the water seemed to go in any direction other than at the plants. I had to be careful with watering, given the cost of water in which woods. My plan had been to arrange the sprinkler hose, a long green hose with holes along it so water would spurt out at intervals and cover the plants, in theory, and when arranged correctly. I planned to place sugarcane mulch over the top. However, the wild rabbits that lived in this part of town seemed to enjoy nothing more than digging holes all over my garden. One of the cheeky things ran past me now. You wouldn't do that if I had a cat or a dog for a pet instead of two borrowed sheep, I called after it. The rabbit disregarded me and scratched the ground, trying to dig a hole. A kookaburra in the gum tree above laughed at me. You're as bad as my mother, I called out to it. That's the first sign of madness, you know. I spun around to see Basil walking up to me, a smile all over his face. I'm not talking to myself. I'm talking to the animals, I pointed out. Sometimes I prefer them to people. I just wanted to call over on my lunch break, Basil said. You were going to text me after you spoke with Tara. I was puzzled. I did. I pulled my phone from my pocket and checked it. The text was still sitting there. It hadn't been sent. Sorry about that. Yes, she confirmed what Ernie said. The detectives definitely think Mum did it. This funeral business will be the death of you. Did I hear my name taken in vain? The voice came from behind the magnolia tree. Ernie took his time materialising. What's going on, guys? Where's your little friend? Basil said. Does he still have his clothes on? I smiled at his tone, secretly pleased. It seemed Basil was jealous of the ghost, no doubt given the fact that the ghost flirted with me. He keeps to himself much of the time, Ernie said. Pardon my interrupting, but I figured this wasn't secret romance stuff. You're talking about the murder, aren't you? I had to admit that we were. We need to look at the suspects, I said. If the police aren't going to dig into it, then I'll have to. So it's either Frank's girlfriend, any of the six guests, or Bryce Wilson, the builder. I don't think it could be him, Ernie said. He plays church music loudly all day. He's too much of a goody two-shoes to do anything. There's your motive right there, I said. Perhaps he found out what sort of escort Frank really was and then killed him. He would have known where the hatpins were kept. But so did all the guests, Basil said. The hatpins were on display in your mother's laundry room. Besides, we still don't know what the murder weapon was. It might have been poison for all we know. Perhaps the police took the hatpins as subterfuge. I turned to Ernie. Have you heard anything snooping around the guests? Ernie shook his head. No, not a thing. That means that two of them weren't in it together. If they were, then they would be discussing it, of course. 
there's still the possibility that someone from one couple was in it with someone from another couple, I said. Then they wouldn't talk about it. Ernie disagreed. They probably would discuss it, but they would have to be careful that no one heard them. And since I'm not there all the time, I might have missed it. I turned off the hose. But I can't see that it would be suspicious if, say, Jenny Thorogood spoke to Bradley Musgrave, for example. They are writing those stories, after all. Basil slapped his thigh. I've got it. Several wild wood ducks scattered. Oh, I didn't mean to scare them. Don't worry, they'll be back in the morning. I feed them over there. I pointed and then saw a hideous garden gnome under my lavender bushes. I gasped. What is it? Basil asked. My mother's been putting those garden gnomes all over my garden. She only does it to irritate me. I don't know where she finds garden gnomes that are reading Bibles anyway. Sorry, what were you going to say? I know what we can do to find some evidence. We need to break into their rooms. Chapter 10 Break into their rooms, I said in horror. Yes, we need to read their ghost stories. Why, Ernie and I said in unison. Most fiction works are autobiographical. At the very least, they have some elements of autobiography in them. For example, if you wrote a book, Laurel, you'd put your mother in it. I shuddered. Sure, but I'd have to tone her down a lot, and even then people would still think the character I based her on was way over the top. Basil nodded. You have a point. At any rate, I think we need to look at their stories. Hours later, Basil and I stood nervously at Mum's back door. We had sent Ernie into the dining room to alert us if any of the guests left. The builder had already gone home for the day. Are you sure the master key will work on all the bedrooms? Basil asked me. I can't be certain, I said, but I'd be surprised if it didn't work. The back door creaked open, and Basil and I exchanged glances. I should have oiled it earlier, I whispered. Basil shrugged. He couldn't hear me, because Mum was playing loud Christian music. Rather than modern Christian music, the music was an old hymn with the volume turned up. Perhaps she thought the noise would drive the devils out of the guests. At least we have cover noise, Basil whispered in my ear. The door to the first guest bedroom also creaked, although no one could have heard it over the loud din downstairs. I looked around the room, hoping to see a laptop or some sort of manuscript, but all I saw was a dresser with nail polish remover, a lipstick, and an open wallet from which had spilled a heap of change. There was a phone being charged next to it, and on the floor was a pile of clothes. The irritating sound of a clock ticked away incessantly and loudly. No sign of a laptop, Basil said, stating the obvious. They're retired teachers. Surely they wouldn't write their stories longhand with a pen and paper, I said in horror. Basil walked over to the bed and lifted piles of clothes, revealing two small laptops. Eureka. He handed one to me, and we both sat on the bed and opened one laptop each. This needs a password, I said to Basil. So does this one, Basil said in disgust. But all laptops do these days, I suppose. We just have to hope to find one that's still open. There might be handwritten notes as well, I pointed out. We don't have time to look for notes yet. Let's go to the other two rooms, and if we don't find anything there, we can start to look for notes. I think we should hurry for the first run through. I agreed. Whose room do you think this is? The Quinn's room, I think. These clothes are maybe more conservative than the other four guests. The second room appeared to belong to the Potters, Bradley and Beck. This room wasn't as untidy as the Quinn's room, and a brightly coloured dress was hanging over a chair. I turned around and jumped when I saw myself in the mirror. I was understandably nervous. After all, I was breaking and entering. Two closed laptops sat side by side on the long wooden desk. Both proved to be password protected. Mum's religious literature was all over the room. I hadn't seen it in the previous room, so I assumed the Quins had removed it. A big canvas with the words, Repent or Perish, 
were painted in bright red on the white background. Under the writing were several black stick figures falling into a fiery pit. That looked like Mum's own handiwork. I walked over to look at the signatures. Sure enough, the names Thelma and Ian were written at the bottom right corner of the painting. Two huge black leather Bibles sat on the dresser. The letters were embossed in heavy gold writing. One said, Extra Additionally Annotated Explanatory Leadership Husband's Study Bible, King James Version. And the other, Extra Additionally Annotated Explanatory Good Submissive Wives Study Bible, King James Version. They appeared to be used as paperweights, so I actually pulled the papers out from under them. They were photocopies of various interviews with people who insisted they had seen ghosts. Basil hurried over to me. We had better check the next room, and then we'll have a better look around if we still have time. That only left the last room. I had been dreading this room because it was my old bedroom. I wondered what mum had done with it after I had moved out. I opened the door and gasped. She had wallpapered the room in heavy golden brocade. I didn't know they sold that sort of thing anymore, not in the last few decades. Gone was my once cheery and bright room. Mum had stuffed it full of oppressive antique furniture. Heavy crimson curtains hung from the windows, obscuring the light. Yellowing lace doilies covered every available surface. The room reeked depressingly of mothballs. Laurel, quickly, over here. Basil beckoned me to the computer, sitting on a giant lace doily on a heavy mahogany desk with a green leather insert top. This computer's open. I hurried to have a look. A glance at the emails told us that the computer belonged to Jenny Thoroughgood. She owns a vintage shop, I said to Basil. There were several emails there asking the woman who was minding the store in her absence how the business was going. Does she have office, Word, Scrivener or anything? I asked Basil. He opened the Word folder on her computer while I looked over his shoulder. Her files were all in disarray. Finally, Basil found one that said ghost stories. Just as I clicked on it, Ernie materialized. Quick, get out of here, they're coming. I took a long stride to the door, but Basil held my arm. Ernie, do we have time to go back the way we came? No, he said. Quick, go the other way. Unfortunately, the only other way was into my mother's bedroom. I grabbed Basil's arm. Follow me. As we rushed for the door, I saw a hat box on the floor. It was quite a lovely vintage one, high gloss paper with Edwardian scenes. Still, I had no time to look at it. We rushed the short distance down the corridor and I shut my mother's door quietly behind us, none too soon as we could already hear voices. Under the bed, I said to Basil. Whose room is this? Basil asked me. From the tone of his voice, I suspected he already knew the awful truth. It's mum's. Basil shuddered. I didn't know if he was shuddering because Frank had been murdered in there, or because it was mum's room. I guess the latter. Luckily for us, mum had a huge antique brass and porcelain bed, so there was plenty of room under it. What if she comes in here and starts getting dressed or something? Basil said in a weak voice. Just don't look, I said. The cover on mum's bed extended to the floor, so unless she looked under the bed, we were safe. Although, come to think of it, perhaps mum did check under her bed for demons every night. I certainly wouldn't put it past her. It's unlikely she'll come in here, I said to Basil. Ian's here, so she'll stay up late talking to him. I was at once proven to be wrong. The door slowly creaked open. Basil and I clutched each other in horror. Is this the window? It was Ian's voice. I shot Basil a look, my unspoken meaning being, why is Ian in my mother's bedroom? Yes, that's the window I can't open, Mum said in a whining tone. Their feet walked straight past the bed. I held my breath. I didn't even want to think what would happen if they discovered us under mum's bed. That would take quite some explaining. Soon I heard the sound of huffing and puffing as Ian struggled to open the window. There you go, Thelma. Thank you, Ian. Now let's go back and have a nice cup of tea and read the Bible to each other. 
What a wonderful idea, Thelma, Ian simpered. Did you notice that Robert and Louise weren't interested in reading scriptures aloud tonight? Notice, Ian? How could I not? They made it obvious. How rude of them. I just can't believe people can be so rude. Yes, they were very rude, Thelma. And Louise wears too much lipstick. I can't believe they said they didn't want to read scriptures. And how rude to refuse to go to church with us. I just don't like them. I don't like them either, Ian. I think there's something funny about them. Have you noticed how their eyes are too close together? Yes, and I don't really like Bradley and Beck either, Ian said. Their clothes are too bright. Have you noticed that they wear horrible clothes? Oh, you're so polite, Ian, my mother said approvingly. That Beck with her low-cut tops showing her wares, and at her age. I'll bet she's trying to attract another man with nothing but adultery in mind. What's the world coming to? Yes, they do wear bright colors. They're trying to draw attention to themselves. Their feet walked back past us and headed in the direction of the door. I hoped they would keep going, but sadly, all four feet came to a stop. It's James and Jenny who are the worst guests, Mum said firmly. Did you hear how they gossiped? Gossiping is ungodly. Yes, vain babblings increase unto more ungodliness, Ian quoted. The door shut behind them, and Basil and I exchanged glances. Do you think we should leave yet? Basil asked me. We should wait for the all clear from Ernie, I whispered back. A ghost materialized, but it wasn't Ernie. It was Frank. He beckoned to me and winked. That's enough of that. Basil said angrily, shimmying out from under the bed. He held out his hand and helped me out. I assume the coast is clear. Ernie appeared next to Frank. Quite frankly, you're right. I'm not in the mood for your jokes, Ernie, I said. Are you sure it's safe for us to leave now? Quite safe. I didn't need to be told twice. I hurried down the hallway with Basil hard on my heels. I tiptoed down the stairs wincing every time one creaked. That was a terrible waste of time, I lamented as soon as we were safely outside. We didn't find out one useful thing. The only thing we found out was that Jenny has a vintage store for all the good that will do us, although she does have a vintage hat box. I have another idea, Basil said. I forced myself to look interested. After all, it had been his idea to search the rooms, and look how that turned out. They forecast thunderstorms for tomorrow night. Why don't we invite all six guests to the funeral home? I can buy snacks and we can place candles around. We can tell them that we want to hear their ghost stories. I'll bet they'll give away some personal information that will lead to one of them implicating themselves as the murderer. What a good idea, I lied, plastering a false smile on my face. Chapter 11 I jumped as another crack of thunder sounded. Basil smiled at me. This thunder's great. It will make it all so much more atmospheric. I wasn't too sure about that idea. Basil was convinced that fiction books were largely autobiographical, but I couldn't see how that would be the case in George R. R. Martin's Game of Thrones. Well, I sure hoped not. I thought my family was bad. Still, I didn't want to point this out to Basil, because it was nice of him to want to gather information. I was grateful that he was trying to help me save my mother from a false accusation. A flash of lightning shot through the window, followed soon after by another crack of thunder. The lights flickered for a few moments, but then went back on. Basil handed me some matches. Laurel, it might be a good idea to hurry and light the candles in case we do lose the power soon. I'll get the food. I had selected some scented candles, a lemongrass and cedar wood, a citrus, a mountain berry, five West Indian lime and coconuts, a sweet pea and jasmine, and several vanilla and brown sugar candles. I knew they would add a delightful fragrance to the room. Basil came back from the kitchen and enveloped me in a tight hug. I don't know if this is going to work, but it's worth a shot. 
he said over the top of my head. I held him closely, running my hands over his muscled back. I hope we do find out some information, anything that would give us a clue as to a motive. My voice was breathless, but before I could say any more, Basil bent his head over mine. My lips parted, and I could taste his breath. The sound of smooching broke us apart. Ernie appeared in front of me, hovering. Could you please land, I said. You know how hovering creeps me out. You know how kissing freaks me out, Ernie countered. Frank appeared and blew me a kiss, much to Basil's obvious annoyance. Everyone be on your best behavior, please, I said in my sternest lecturing tone. The guests will be here any minute. Where's your mother? Ernie asked me. I can't imagine she'd approve of ghost stories. She's at the weekly church ladies' night, I said. She has to be there because she runs that group. Is she likely to come back early from this group meeting? Basil asked me. My mother had often returned home from her groups because she had trouble getting others to attend. No, Ian's going to this group. It's a prayer group, so she doesn't mind if only the two of them turn up. I thought it was a women's group, Basil said, frowning. I held up my hands. I know that. Don't ask me. I don't understand the workings of my mother's ladies' night, or her mind, for that matter. What's the subject? Ernie asked. I sighed. They're praying against women's rights. Basil made a strangling sound, while Ernie materialized and then dematerialized a split second later. You're kidding. I shook my head. You know what mum's like. And you're trying to keep her out of prison because, Ernie said. I laughed, but then realized that Basil and Ernie looked solemn. I don't actually like her at all, but she is my mother. They looked unconvinced. At any rate, I was saved from further explanation as the six guests arrived together. Your mother isn't coming, is she? Beck asked me, her voice trembling. Absolutely not, I said. Just to be sure, I went out into the foyer and locked the door to the building. We're safe now, I said upon my return, just as a crack of thunder made everyone jump. The lights went out. Never mind, we have plenty of candles. I'm scared and I'm a ghost, Ernie said, while Frank winked at me. It was going to be a long night. Basil had brought lots of snacks and had placed them all around the long table. I also had wine, because Basil thought it would loosen people's tongues. After everyone had eaten, Basil spoke up. As you know, I thought it would be fun for us to all collect here and tell ghost stories. A thunderstorm makes a good backdrop. There was a murmur of agreement. I'll go first, Bradley said. I've always been interested in the ghost of Frederick Fisher, the ghost who solved his own murder. A hush settled over the group as Bradley continued. In the middle of winter, 1826, Fisher had a drink with some friends at the Campbelltown pub and then went home. He was never seen again. His best friend, Worrell, told everyone that Fisher had gone back to England, and he also said that Fisher had given him all his property. People were suspicious. Worrell was arrested, but was never prosecuted. A few months later, a farmer by the name of John Farley had been out drinking and was on his way home when he saw Frederick Fisher sitting on the rail of a bridge right near Fisher's land. He asked Fisher where he'd been, but he didn't respond. As Farley got close, he realized it wasn't a solid figure, but in fact a ghost. I trembled, and Basil put his arms around me. I spoke to ghosts most every day, but tales told in the dark still scared me. Farley, the farmer, was terrified, Bradley said. The ghost of Frederick Fisher pointed to a certain spot at the creek. Police searched the creek and found Frederick's body buried in a shallow grave. Just before he was executed, Worrell finally admitted he killed him. The whole event was actually reported in collections of ghost stories assembled by Arthur Conan Doyle. So this is a true story, Basil said with obvious disappointment. The candle flames flared and then flickered softly. 
Yes, it's a famous story. It happened at Campbelltown, not far from Sydney. Your boyfriend's theory fell flat there, Ernie said, hovering behind Basil. Hardly anything autobiographical in that. I waved him away and then wished I hadn't when everyone looked at me. A fly, I said lamely. Fremantle Prison in Western Australia has many ghosts, Beck said. It's no surprise that it's haunted. It was built by convicts after 1850 and then later became a prison. Almost 50 people were executed there. Lots of owls mysteriously appear on every hanging anniversary. I exchanged a worried look with Basil. I hoped all the ghost stories weren't factual. Beck's voice filled with enthusiasm. In 1936, the Fremantle Lunatic Asylum opened. They say it's the most haunted building in the entire Southern Hemisphere. Women who go in there feel their hair pulled, usually women with red hair. A lot of people report that their cameras suddenly stop working. I shot Ernie a dark look as he hovered above Beck, making fake ghost noises and pretending to pull her hair. I didn't even know if he could see me glaring at him, given that it was so dark. American soldiers were stationed there at one point, she continued softly. They reported being touched by invisible hands. Even today, people hear loud footsteps approaching, but don't see anyone. There was one instance where doors repeatedly shut and opened over the entire building all at once. There were lots of witnesses to that. And then there's the famous kissing ghost. Frank apparently decided to get in on the act. He hovered over to me and puckered his lips. Basil tried to swat him away, but his hands passed through him. Stop, I snapped. Frank drew away. Sorry, Beck said. I hurried to explain as best I could. No, it wasn't you. Sorry, I'm, um, a bit scared, I lied. I could hardly say that the ghost of an escort was trying to kiss me. The famous Sydney quarantine station is extremely haunted, Jenny said. It was used as recently as 1984. Any ships carrying people suspected of having a contagious disease placed people in quarantine there. It's an island in Sydney Harbour, you know, she added. I nodded. I've seen some ghost documentaries about it. They run paranormal tours there. You can even stay overnight. You could run paranormal tours here, Laurel, Ernie said. Only I don't know how to move stuff or make normal people hear me. Are you saying I'm not normal? I asked him. Of course not, Jenny said, horrified. I waved one hand in the air. Sorry, I was just thinking out aloud. All six guests nodded. Ah, yes, you were thinking you were talking to your mother, Jenny said. Anyway, there are at least 50 ghosts there. Visitors are often pushed by unseen hands. You know, perhaps we should hold a seance tonight. Oh, I don't know, Louise said nervously. Jenny laughed. It would be fun, by the candlelight and in a thunderstorm. Is anyone there? Is anyone there? She said in a fake moan. A crack of thunder heralded the door being flung open. An apparition appeared in the doorway. We all screamed. Chapter 12 Janet, I managed to squeak. What are you doing here? Working late, she said as she stepped into the room. And you never pay me overtime. Why did you all scream? What are you all doing? We're telling ghost stories, Basil supplied. Or rather, James and Jenny, Robert and Louise, and Bradley and Beck are telling ghost stories. Janet nodded and then took a seat at the table. Yes, Thelma told me that some heathens were staying with her. I winced. Janet was nothing if not forthright. Why aren't you at Mum's church meeting tonight? I asked her. No one in their right mind goes to your mother's meetings, Janet said. I bet Pastor Green wishes she'd go to some other church and drive them nuts instead of all of us. Anyway, I'll join you. You won't go to hell, Janet snorted at me. Hardly. It's not as if you're conducting a seance. 
Jenny shot me a look, or at least I assumed so, given that the only light was supplied by flickering candlelight. I've been on a paranormal tour to the Monte Cristo homestead in Juni, Janet announced loudly. Do you know where that is? Before anyone had a chance to speak, she pushed on. It's in country New South Wales, near the old highway between Sydney and Melbourne. I didn't see anything, but other people on the tour said they saw ghosts. Lots of people have seen mysterious lights. What sort of lights? Beck asked her. I mean, full on lights, Janet said. Once the current owners were driving home and saw their house was lit up like a Christmas tree. Every single room had blazing white light pouring from it. Very bright light. When they reached the house, the lights all suddenly went off. That's happened a few times. Lots of people have seen it. Of course, they're not really ghosts. They're demons. I kicked Basil under the table. I didn't want Janet to ruin our slim hope of finding out anything about the guests that could lead to solving Frank's murder. He nodded, but before he had a chance to come up with anything, Janet spoke again. I've seen the Min Min lights too. I am sure everyone in the room knew what the Min Min lights were, but Janet explained anyway. They're those mysterious lights in the outback. I've seen them up close. There was a murmur of surprise around the table. Janet pushed on. I was once dating a drover, and I went camping with him for a week in the outback. We had separate tents, of course, just in case you're all thinking I'm the whore of Babylon. I left the campfire to take a bathroom break, and then I headed back to the campfire. Only it wasn't a campfire, it was a Min Min light, but I didn't know at the time. I followed it for miles before Mick found me. You know, I was close to the campfire, and this Min Min light looked just like the glow of a campfire, only it kept moving in front of me. Mick said many people go missing because they follow the Min Min lights. I knew not to follow one, of course, only I didn't know that's what I was doing. There's a scientific explanation for them, I'm sure. I shivered. I had always been intrigued by the Min Min lights. I'd heard people say they could move around in circles and change direction at will. They could speed or go slowly. Scientists had tried to explain them away as refracted light but the lights had followed and reacted to people. Many thousands of people had seen them, and I knew that some were associated with causing static electricity and also a strange smell. My story is about the big prison at Maitland, Bradley said, breaking the silence. We're going to drive to Maitland when we leave here and do one of the tours. Did you know that Maitland has the longest acting prison in Australia? and 16 men were hanged there. Countless numbers of ghosts have been reported. He stopped speaking and nodded wildly, clearly carried away with excitement. We've booked in for the Ghost Hunting 101 night. You get to use real ghost hunting equipment. I decided to ask them straight out. So all your stories are about actual ghosts, no fiction. For some reason, I thought you were all writing fiction. We're a writing group, Robert said, and we usually do write fiction, but this time we thought we'd do some research on actual ghosts. So your fiction is always about ghosts, I asked him. He shrugged. Not exactly, but we all write horror fiction. Yes, we all attended a large Melbourne writers group for some months, and then the six of us ended up spending time together when we realized we were the only ones interested in writing horror. James explained. I've been to Janolan Caves, Janet blurted out. Everyone turned to stare at her. I was not surprised by her segue, but I was the only one. Is it haunted? I asked her. Of course, Janet shook her head at me. Why else would I mention it? I could think of several reasons, but I held my tongue. I didn't see any ghosts, because ghosts don't exist. Ghosts are actually demons. Janet said in a matter-of-fact voice. Both Ernie and Frank looked offended. Janet stood up. The demons run riot there, turning lights on and off and rattling security gates and pretending to be ghosts. I suppose there are more demons there because the caves go miles underground, so they're further away from God in heaven. Everyone was struck speechless. Just then, 
lightning flashed behind her, giving her an eerie blue aura. The air crackled. The front door slammed. I grabbed Basil's arm. I locked it, I squeaked. Janet leant close to me. I left it unlocked when I came in, she whispered. I continued to cling to Basil as we heard steps marching towards the reception door. It opened. I held my breath. Out, foul demons, Janet yelled as a boom of thunder reverberated around the room. Chapter 13 Mum and Ian stepped into the room. Janet breathed a sigh of relief to see them, but I would have preferred demons. The detectives have falsely accused me, Mum said, her face white. Laurel, I tried to call you several times. What were you doing? Where were you? We were all chatting and my phone was turned off, I said, annoyed with myself for being defensive. Just then, the lights came back on. Mum and Ian sat next to Janet. The six guests all fidgeted, all clearly embarrassed. We should go now, James said. I stood up, intending to show them to the door. Thanks so much for coming. It was, uh, fun, Jenny said lamely. I'm going to, Janet announced. I'll show them out, Laurel. This time I'll lock the door. We waited until we heard the front door shut. What happened, Mum? Mum twisted her white lace handkerchief in her hands. The detectives told me about the murder weapon. They came to my house and forced me to go with them to be questioned. Ian dared to interrupt Mum. Thelma called Pastor Green, who sent her a lawyer. Thank goodness for that, I said. Ian pursed his lips. He was a lawyer from our church, of course. Of course, I said with more than a hint of sarcasm. Pastor Green was one of the good guys, but Mum and Ian would not allow anyone who didn't go to their church to do anything for them. Their cars were always breaking down because they went to a substandard mechanic who attended their church. Is he qualified? Ian appeared to be affronted. He's just out of law school and was doing contract law, but we'll hope and pray. I don't need a lawyer. I have justice on my side, Mum said primly. And even more, I have the great judge. All right then, I said quickly, hoping to forestall her from going into one of her usual rants. Did the detective say what the murder weapon was? It's just a bunch of nonsense, Mum said crossly. She made a big show of blowing out the candles. If God wanted us to have candles, we wouldn't have electricity. Only new age heathens and witches use candles. May they burn in hell. Ian's cheeks puffed up. Suffer not a witch to live, he said dramatically. I rubbed my temples and fought the urge to say something horrible to him, perhaps even strangle him. Instead, I addressed Mum. What's nonsense? Hat pins. Hat pins are nonsense. Stop twisting my words, Laurel. Basil leant forward. Precisely what did the detectives tell you about hat pins, Mrs. Bay? His tone was steely. Mum's eyes darted from side to side. Tom was killed by a metal hat pin with an enamel coating. They said it was a vintage one. My jaw fell open. Mum had never given such a straight answer to me. I nudged Basil with my elbow. He took the hint and continued his questioning. Was it one of the hat pins they took from you? Mum shook her head. There was a missing hat pin. Did the detectives find it? I asked her. Of course not, Laurel, Mum snapped. I said it was missing. She avoided looking at Basil as she spoke. I'm just trying to help you, Mum, I said through gritted teeth, shooting a threatening look at Ian in case he felt duty bound to defend her. Mum jumped to her feet. I can't do anything right, Laurel. I always say the wrong thing. She burst into a bout of fake sobbing and hurried from the room, Ian hard on her heels. I rushed past them to unlock the door. I wanted them both gone as soon as possible. I wasn't in the mood for more drama. No good deed goes unpunished, Basil said dryly, as I leant back against the door, locked once more. 
Would someone have to know what they were doing to kill someone with a hat pin? I asked him. I mean, would they need to have medical knowledge? I've been looking into it, Basil said. Invite me into your apartment and I'll tell you all about it. You're not a vampire. You don't need a special invitation, Ernie said, breaking what might have been a moment. I'm just trying to get away from Laurel's admirer there. Basil jabbed his finger in the direction of Frank, who was still smiling at me in rather a too friendly fashion. Ernie took a step back and bowed with a flourish. I unlocked my apartment door, and once Basil was through it, I leant back against it with a sigh of relief. The story of my life lately, I admitted, locking and unlocking doors. At least this door keeps out unwanted visitors and all evil, Basil said. I nodded. Yes, Mum doesn't have a key. Basil chuckled. No, I meant ghosts, with all the wards you have around your apartment. I had to laugh. Glass of wine? We can sit in front of the big window and watch the storm. Minutes later, Basil and I were sitting on my soft couch, sipping wine and watching the lightning. It was a magnificent display. The huge window had been expensive, especially as the builders had to remove most of the wall, but I was pleased with the way it had turned out. In the daytime, it afforded a beautiful view of the pastures on which grazed Basil's two pet sheep, Arthur and Martha. Mum's house could not be seen at all, and that was the way I liked it. I hadn't been sure how to decorate my apartment, as my style in Melbourne had been Hamptons, but here in the country, in the mountains, that was hardly the thing. I had gone for a mix of industrial and shabby chic. It wouldn't win any design awards, but it was mine. I hate to break the mood, Basil said softly, but I've been googling hat pins ever since we found out that the police had confiscated your mother's. Do you want to hear about it? Not particularly, I said, resting my head on his shoulder. He put his arm around me and laughed. Apparently he thought I was joking. In Victorian times in England, they passed laws deeming hat pins to be concealed weapons if they were found in someone's pocket or purse. I had no response, so I kept silent, liking the feel of his arm resting on my shoulders. Undaunted, Basil pressed on. I came across old reports of a serial killer by the name of Jabber Jerry. He used hat pins to kill his victims in Los Angeles. Was he a doctor or something? Basil shrugged. No idea, but from what I've read, killing somebody with a hat pin doesn't require special knowledge. Hat pins have killed many people, even by accident. In 1910, hat pins were 13 inches long. I sat upright. You know, we saw that vintage hat box in Jenny's room. She has a vintage store. I wonder if she sells hat pins. We could Google her. Her store isn't online, Basil said. I checked. She doesn't have a website. What about Facebook? Instagram? Basil shook his head. No. I leant back into Basil again. It's only circumstantial evidence, I suppose, I said. Mum has hat pins. Jenny probably has hat pins. Yes, but we know your mother didn't do it, Basil pointed out. I ran a hand through my hair. I must be more tired than I thought. What do we do now? Tell the police that Jenny has a vintage store and sells hat pins? We don't actually know she sells hat pins, Basil said but I think it's worth us snooping around her store and asking questions. If we find out she's been here in town without James at any time, that's all the more reason to suspect she might have met Frank before. Surely Frank wouldn't keep that information from us, I said. He said he didn't know any of the guests, or the builder for that matter. And besides, any one of them could have snatched that hat pin from the laundry room. It doesn't make sense that Jenny killed Frank with her hat pin she would have used one of Mum's to cover her tracks. Or it could be that Jenny killed him with her hat pin and did exactly that. Stole one of your mother's hat pins to throw suspicion on her, Basil said. If you really want to help your mother, I think we need to go to Melbourne and ask questions of whoever is running Jenny's store while she's here. Chapter 14 here we go again, I sighed, leaning back into my seat. Are you all right? Basil asked, touching me lightly on the arm. 
I looked over to see him smiling at me, and I couldn't help but smile back, in spite of my nerves. Basil and I were on our way to Melbourne to visit Jenny Thorogood's store in search of clues. We had flown to Newcastle Airport first and had just caught our connection straight to Melbourne. I was sitting by the window, nervously clutching my armrests as other passengers took their seats. Flying had never been my strong suit, and I especially wasn't looking forward to the airport at Tullamarine in Melbourne. The airport itself was nothing offensive as such, but it was as chaotic as any airport in a major city. Getting through security took ages, though I wouldn't have to worry about it when I landed. Basil and I were also flying back at the end of the day, so it was something on my mind. More than that, the airport felt enormous, and then there was the fact we had to get all sorts of public transport just to get where we were going. It was daunting. Perhaps I had turned into a country girl after all. The trip was exhausting, which was exacerbated by my extreme dislike of flying. Rationally, I knew that the chance of dying in a plane crash was next to zero, but that didn't help calm me down much when I was thousands of feet in the air. Basil was always cool and collected, and seeing him helped soothe my nerves a bit. As the plane made its way to the runway proper, I felt myself clutch the hand rest again. Basil looked over and placed his hand on mine. Do you want some water? He handed me a bottle. I nodded gratefully and had a swig, wishing it was something much, much stronger. Takeoff was always the worst part for me, as I hated the feeling of being pushed back into the seat. It was made worse when coupled with the feeling of my stomach dropping as the plane lifted from the ground. I closed my eyes and breathed deeply, trying to control my pangs of nervousness and the pounding of my heart as the plane gathered speed. We were in the air before I knew it. I opened my eyes to see that my knuckles were white, clenched tightly over Basil's hand. He was wincing, but didn't say anything. Sorry, I whispered, releasing his hand. He massaged it gently as soon as I let go. It's okay, he said with a smile. It should heal with barely any surgery at all. I forced a smile, but I was too nervous to laugh. I saw flight attendants walking around, which always calmed me down. I figured that they knew more about flying than most, so if they were calmly walking around, then we weren't in much danger. Then again, maybe they were new. The flight was only a little over an hour, so by the time we were in the air and level, the attendants started serving snacks. Neither of us wanted one, and almost immediately the plane commenced landing procedures. I always felt a bit calmer knowing we were starting to land, even though it just meant we were heading towards the ground, which was exactly what I was worried would happen. We finally landed, and I breathed a huge sigh of relief. It was exhausting to be so worried, and a bit frustrating when I knew it wasn't really dangerous. Still, I was beside myself with excitement to be on solid ground again. The only thing that worried me was that we still had two flights left in the afternoon before we were home. Basil and I walked through the airport and made it to a shuttle bus at a brisk pace. Due to the fact that we were only visiting on a day trip, we didn't need any luggage, which saved us a huge amount of time. Basil and I bought a return ticket from the airport to Southern Cross Station, one of the central train stations in Melbourne, and sat next to a window halfway down the bus. It wasn't long until we were moving, as the buses always filled immediately from all the people at the airport. It was a strange feeling to see Melbourne again after being away for so long. On the one hand, I missed it terribly. It was a huge, vibrant city packed with people who loved art, culture, and more importantly, excellent coffee. On the other hand, cities were absolutely exhausting. Traveling anywhere always involved a series of vehicles and navigating huge crowds, which was something I liked to avoid even on the best of days. On top of that, I had to admit that the city wasn't much of a looker either. It was largely drab and grey, though that did make the large works of public art, or graffiti, depending on where it was painted, all the more striking. We arrived at Southern Cross in about half an hour and caught a train to Paran, 
a fairly high-class suburb not far from the central business district. Jenny's store wasn't far from the train station, so it would be easy enough to visit the store and make it back for our return flight. I couldn't help but be a little sad that we couldn't spend more time in the city where I had lived for years, but I was still very much looking forward to getting home. Still, with all the time taken to get a train, then a bus, then get through airport security, we actually wouldn't have much time at all before we had to start the return journey. I wondered if it would all be worth it. Basil and I stepped off the train at the station and commenced our walk to the store, which was about ten minutes away, according to my phone's GPS. It was cold, as it usually was in Melbourne. I was more used to it than most, but I found myself shivering a little. The wind was typically severe as well. Basil and I leant heavily into it to try and trudge forward. It was easy to see that, while I did love Melbourne, it wasn't always my favourite place in the world, and I couldn't wait to get inside. We walked through the busy streets, past outdoor tables of happy, trendy people sipping coffee and looking at their tablets, and finally arrived after spending several minutes looking for the store. It turned out that my GPS was off a little, which meant we couldn't quite see the exterior of the shop when we arrived at the destination. After a little bit of hunting around, we found the sign hanging out front, This Means Closet. I thought the name quite strange. I figured it must be some sort of play on words, but I couldn't figure it out. At any rate, name aside, it was Jenny's vintage clothing store, and I felt a tingle of nervousness and excitement at finally arriving. I assumed it would be easy enough to see if Jenny's store stocked the kind of hatpins that were used in the murder, but it might be harder to dig up any more concrete information on her other than that. I took a deep breath, glanced at Basil, and the two of us walked inside. It was a fairly small store, cluttered with clothes of all sorts that lined old brick walls. It looked as if it should have been musty or uncomfortable, but there was a pleasant freshness to the air, as well as plenty of light through the huge windows and relatively modern music playing. The tall, spiky indoor plants were bright green and thriving. There was only one person working there. She was a middle-aged woman busying herself behind the counter and not paying much attention to us as we entered. I guessed she had plastered the entire contents of a bottle of patchouli essential oil on herself, given the heavy aroma that pervaded the store. I sneezed, and she fixed her attention on me. I decided it would be best to look around a little before talking to her, so as not to seem suspicious. I decided to find some hat pins before I pressed her for information on Jenny. I nodded to Basil, and the two of us split up, looking around the store for hat pins. It only took a moment for both of us to find some, as the store was positively littered with them. If Jenny had been the murderer, it was a wonder that she'd only used the one hat pin, as she clearly had some kind of affinity for them. Do you need a hand? The store assistant asked from behind, causing me to jump. I had smelt her coming, but I was otherwise preoccupied with all the hat pins. I turned around to see her smiling at me politely, clearly uncaring as to whether I really needed a hand or not. Not that I blamed her. It wasn't fair to assume she would be deeply invested in the wants and needs of every customer who walked into the store. Oh, yes, I'm actually an old friend of Jenny Thoroughgood's. I lied. Is she in today? I knew full well that she wasn't, of course, but I couldn't think of another reason why I'd be in her store asking after her. I'm afraid she's gone on a vacation with her husband, the woman explained. She won't be back for some time. Is there anything I could help you with instead? She did at least seem more interested this time. Oh, yes, I said, perhaps a little too dramatically. She went on that writing vacation with four other people, right? Oh, and with James, her husband, of course. The woman smiled at me. That's right. I thought it was a bit of a strange thing to add that Jenny had gone away with exactly four other people, but I hoped knowing that fact did at least add some degree of credibility to my story. Are they doing okay? I asked. Jenny and her husband, I mean. Perhaps I shouldn't say anything, 
but I just wanted to make sure everything's all right between them. I had decided that suggesting some kind of past problems would make me seem like a good friend of Jenny's, and if this woman had no idea what I was talking about, then she could just chalk it up to being private information. They're still not great, she admitted, as Basil and I exchanged a glance. Last I heard, they were getting along fine, though. It's not really my place to say. Oh, of course, I nodded. Well, since I'm here, do you have any other hat pins? I knew it was a stupid question as soon as I asked it. There were so many hat pins in the store that she couldn't possibly know what I meant by other. Just what is on display, she explained politely, demonstrating a mastery of retail diplomacy. Jenny has quite the personal collection, as I'm sure you know, but ours are all fairly similar. Were you after something like the ones she has, or something more plain? I can call her if you like. Uh, oh, I stammered. Perhaps I should have a think about it and come back later. I nodded goodbye and all but pushed Basil out the door. What do you think? I asked him. Well, it sounds likely, he nodded. She had a hat pin or two. Or fifty, I interjected. Right, or fifty. It also seems as though her marriage was going through a rough patch for whatever reason. It's possible that she hired the escort, and if she did, then she almost certainly would have had a hat pin on her person. She's quite a likely suspect at this point. Basil scratched his chin. I'd say she's my main pick. But why would she kill him? I asked. Hiring an escort behind her husband's back is one thing, but murder is something else entirely. Basil shrugged. I can only assume it was a spur of the moment thing. Maybe Frank threatened to tell her husband or something. I nodded in agreement as we started our walk back to the train station. I thought of what was coming, all for a few moments worth of information. The train, the bus, then the plane, then security, then another plane. I sighed weakly. This day has been a waste of time. I wouldn't say that. We got to spend the day together. Basil suddenly pulled me to him and kissed me urgently, though briefly. Chapter 15 The escort agency was in the next biggest town, according to Google Maps. Brothels had been legal in this state for some time now, so we didn't have to go all special ops to find its location. It was on the edge of town, near a bushland reserve. The building itself was unassuming and looked as if it had once been a barber's shop. It was white fibro cement siding, known in these parts simply as fibro, and the awning was red, white and blue stripes. It had no street appeal, but I supposed that didn't matter to clients. The whole street was old, dated and entirely unassuming. Basil drove down the narrow lane between the escort service and a rather hideous old building in unpleasant shades of dirty cream and faded green, narrowly missing a huge lily-pilly tree. The narrow lane opened onto a wide parking lot, around which was abundant bamboo screening. I'm a bit nervous about this, I said to Basil. You and me both, he muttered. Basil opened the front door for me, and it was all I could do not to gasp. What a contrast to the exterior. Everything was electric blue, from the carpet to the paint on the walls to the lighting, even the plush furniture. A tall potted palm in a corner radiated a reddish-purple tinge. Five large couches in the Chesterfield style, all blue, were placed around the room. The woman at the front desk looked up at us with a smile. May I have your names, please? She looked like a normal, everyday receptionist, but I didn't know what I was expecting. I'd never been in a brothel before, and it was making me quite nervous. Before we could answer, she tapped some keys on her computer. I didn't know we had a couple's booking today. She looked at me over the top of her glasses. I hurried to explain. Oh, we're not clients. We just wanted to come for some information. I just wanted to say I'm sorry for the loss of Tom. Uh, I mean Frank Wright. Right, right, she said hurriedly. I was grateful that Ernie wasn't there. I'm Laurel Bay. My mother had booked him, and he died in my mother's house. 
I gave myself a mental slap for not thinking this through. How could I explain that mum had wanted him as a GPS, rather than the reason people usually want escorts? I decided it wouldn't matter anyway. I'm Ellie Pons, she said, standing up and offering her hand. I shook it, and Basil did likewise. I noticed she was quite conservatively dressed, black pants and a blue floral shirt. At least, it might have been a white shirt, and the lighting made it look blue. She was wearing a string of pearls over the buttoned-up shirt and matching pearl earrings. Her hair was cut in a stylish short bob, but made her look older than her years. Poor Frank was very popular around here. I hope the police catch whoever did that to him. I nodded. It's a terrible thing. Do many escorts get killed in the line of duty? I mean, I suppose there are many married people and people in relationships who come here as clients. So there would be lots of people with motives, I suppose. Ellie eyed me speculatively. Are you interested in becoming an escort? Basil chuckled. No, 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 was all I managed to say. Ellie turned her attention to Basil. What about you? We need to replace Frank. It pays well, and it's perfectly legal. It's not legal to be a pimp, mind you, but it's legal to run a brothel, and it's legal to be an escort. I didn't like the way she was looking at Basil. We're here because we want to make sure that Frank's murder is solved, I said. If we give you a list of names, can you tell us if any of them have ever used the escorts here? Ellie shook her head. I'm terribly sorry, but that information is private. We can't give out that information due to reasons of confidentiality. I hope you can understand. Oh, yes, I do. I was half expecting her to say that. I suppose the police have that information. Ellie tapped her pen on the edge of her keyboard. No, actually, they didn't want us to cross-check any names. They just wanted a list of Frank's clients. If Ellie thought it was strange that we were investigating as well as the police, she gave no sign of it. The phone rang, and she excused herself to answer it. Yes, I'd be happy to book you for Lionel. I just need your full name, address, and date of birth. She tapped on more keys and then said, Thank you. You're booked in. I'll see you then. Have a nice day. She looked back at us and smiled. Sorry I couldn't help you. If you ever change your mind about being escorts, please call me. She handed each of us a card and then pointed to Basil. You, especially. Frank was with us a long time, and it's going to be hard to replace him. But we will need to replace him soon. We usually operate this place fully booked. We thanked her and walked out the door. Well, Basil, if the accounting business ever goes downhill, you can always change careers. When Basil didn't reply, I turned to see his face was beet red. You're embarrassed, I said with a laugh. Basil laughed too, but it was a forced laugh. I am a little, if I'm to be honest. At least it was a productive visit. We had reached the car, and I looked at him over the hood. Did you say productive? I thought it was a complete waste of time. Basil unlocked the car. Did you hear her ask whoever was on the other end of the phone for her full name, address, and date of birth? We just need to find out Jenny's, and then you can call the agency and pretend to be her. You'll soon know if she's been a client there at any time, because she'll be in the records. That makes me a little nervous, I confessed. For a start, how are we going to find out all that information about Jenny? And secondly, what if the receptionist remembers my voice? Basil reversed the car. She won't recognize your voice. Plenty of people call her all day, and you were just a one-off random person. You won't have any worries there. Now we just have to figure out how to get Jenny's full name, address, and date of birth. My mind was already racing by the time Basil left me at the front of the funeral home and went back to work. I hurried inside, making a mental note to water the garden again soon. I looked around my office. Basil had recently brought me some flowers, and they were in water on a small table in a corner of the room. They were pretty gerberas in vibrant shades of red, orange, and yellow. I had been changing their water daily to keep them alive as long as possible, but I think I was losing the battle. The five potted Japanese peace lilies, all in varying sizes, were doing much better. I retrieved a spray bottle from a cupboard 
and sprayed a light mist over them. I looked at my desk and shuddered. Next to my desktop computer was a huge pile of paperwork that seemed to have a life of its own, given the way it seemed to grow all by itself. I averted my eyes and sat on my chair and turned on the desktop. I googled the type of identification guests needed when booking into vacation stays. I knew mum had used one of the standard vacation accommodation services, but I couldn't remember which one. After only a few minutes on the net, it seemed there was a very good chance that she would have taken a copy of each driver's license or passport. Now I just had to find out where she would keep the information. I walked back out of the funeral home, my mind on the huge pile of paperwork on my desk. I really needed someone to do it, but the business couldn't quite afford that yet. I didn't want to be in the position where I was running a business simply to pay staff. It needed to make a better profit than that. It was a hot day, and although it was far wiser to water gardens at night, my night would be taken up with paperwork, and likely the murder investigation to boot. I turned on the sprinklers, after all. Mum was in her garden, muttering to her plants. Your garden is looking lovely, Mum, I said. She stood up and adjusted her large straw hat. Laurel, you shouldn't be out in the sun with your fair skin. You know how you always get freckles, and freckles are not an attractive look. No wonder you're not married. I happen to like freckles, I said defiantly, but then remembered that honey catches more flies. Too late. Mum was already on a roll. John Jones told me he doesn't like women with freckles. I don't give a... I just managed to catch myself in time. You look hot, Mum. Would you like a glass of cold water? Mum shot me a look of disgust. I'm not one of those new age people who drinks five glasses of water a day, thinking it's good for you, she said sternly. I'm sure a little cold water won't hurt you just this once, I said, pushing down my annoyance. It's awfully hot out in the sun. And doesn't the Bible say not to refuse a glass of water? I didn't know if the Bible actually said that, but it was worth a try. Mum appeared to be thinking this over. Well, thank you, Laurel. I just have a little more work to do outside, and then I'll come inside to have a nice cup of tea with Bryce. Would you please switch on the electric jug? Sure. I hurried into Mum's house as fast as I could without creating suspicion, and then walked straight past Bryce, the builder, down to the back of the house to Mum's office. Mum's office was nothing like mine. Whereas mine was bright and cheery, hers was dark and musty. The furniture consisted of a kitchen chair and an old laminate table with metal legs that had probably graced someone's kitchen in the 1950s. In stark contrast was a brand new and very expensive looking desktop computer. It wasn't on. And in fact, I very much doubted that mum would know how to turn it on. Mum loved spending sprees above all else and typically bought completely unnecessary items. In fact, she went to the grocery store every day. I had always suspected that her refrigerator was a TARDIS. Failing that, the only logical explanation could be that she had to throw out a lot of food. I turned my attention to Mum's paperwork. There were stacks of paper flung haphazardly around the room. Five piles of paper were stacked in a row under the window, partially obscured by yellowing lace curtains. They were shut, of course. Mum always thought that people would look inside if all the curtains weren't shut. To my relief, there were photocopies of each person's passport at the other end of the desk. Jenny's was halfway through the pile. I whipped out my phone and took photos. I put everything back the way it was and then hurried into the kitchen. Bryce looked startled to see me. Sorry I scared you, I said. Oh, I thought it was the detectives again, he said in an angry voice. They've been snooping around here, asking lots of questions. About my mother, I said in alarm. Yes, about Thelma and about everyone. But I'm hoping and praying they'll find the murderer soon. I simply nodded and then filled the electric jug with water. Mum says she'll come inside soon to have a cup of tea with you. I noted that Bryce looked less than pleased to hear the news, and I wondered why. There was no cold water in the refrigerator, so I filled Mum a glass from the kitchen sink, clearly annoying Bryce as I did so. 
Sorry, should I have used the butler's pantry? Bryce merely grunted. Mum appeared as soon as I set foot on the porch. What took you so long, Laurel? I don't want a glass of water now. I'm going to have a nice cup of tea. She hurried past me before I could hand her the glass. I tipped the water onto the nearest plant and left the empty glass sitting next to the porch step. When I reached the garden outside the funeral home, I hesitated as to whether I should let the sprinkler continue or whether I should turn it off. I decided to turn it off. I could always turn it on again later if I had time. At least the flowers had sufficient water to keep them going until the next day. I had so many jobs to do, most of them minor, but all of which would have dire consequences if I ignored them. I locked myself in my office and hoped that no one would knock. It was unlikely that anyone would. I took the landline off the hook and then looked at the business card the brothel's receptionist had given me. I experimented with a few fake voices and was glad that Ernie wasn't there to mock me. I hesitated. Just get it over with, I said aloud. I mentally prepared myself one more time and then called. The receptionist answered at once. Hello, this is Jenny Farragood, I said in what I hoped was an imitation of Jenny's voice. I'd like to make a booking, please. Certainly, are you a regular client? Yes. May I have your full name, address and date of birth? I had the photo of Jenny's passport on my phone screen, so I rattled off all the details. Oh yes, I see you in the system now. I stood up, excited. I was on to something. I would like to make a booking with Frank, please, I said. Ellie did not speak for a moment. I'm sorry, he no longer works here, she said after a long lapse. Wouldn't you prefer your regular, Mark? I'll have to think it over and call you back, I said hurriedly before hanging up. Chapter 16 I texted Basil to update him and then wandered back over to Mum's house. I considered calling the detectives and telling them that Jenny Thorogood had been a client at the escort agency, but I had no idea how I would tell them I had procured that information. I also considered calling it in anonymously. I hadn't come to a decision, which is why I found myself in Mum's house again. Mum was nowhere to be found, so I looked in the kitchen. Your mother and Ian are outside, the builder informed me, pointing in the direction of the back door. They're praying against snails. Snails? I said in shock, wondering if I hadn't heard him properly. Bryce simply nodded and went back to his business. It seems like you're here long hours, seven days a week, I said. Building must be a hard business. Bryce grunted. I have five children, and I'm paying just about everything I earn in child support. I'm divorced. I did my best to hide my surprise. Mum wouldn't usually allow a divorced person in her house. I said something noncommittal, and then walked outside in search of Mum. I had no trouble finding them. Mum and Ian were loudly casting the spirits of snail demons out of the garden and quoting scriptures about pestilence at them. What is it, Laurel? She snapped. Can't you see we're busy? I was just wondering where all your guests were. Mum stopped waving her arms at snails for a moment. Oh, I told them I'd serve them coffee and cake. Why don't you do it for me? And send Bryce outside. There are too many snails, so we need more prayer power. Sure. I wondered if Mum intended to pay him for his prayer time. Mum, Bryce tells me he's divorced. Mum glared at me. Yes, he is, but it wasn't his fault. You told me all divorcees go to hell, I pointed out with some satisfaction. I just told you it wasn't his fault, Laurel, Mum snapped. His wife ran away with another man. She's the sinner, not him. And now the poor man is forced to hand over all his money to that Jezebel. I shrugged and left them. I was pleased for the opportunity to speak to Jenny. I wasn't sure what I would say, but I would just have to play it by ear. When I returned to the house, Jenny and Beck were already at the back door. Mum's busy in the garden, so I'm going to see to the coffee and cake for you all. Would you like some help? They both said in unison. Yes, please. The pair followed me into the kitchen, where Bryce was doing something behind an oven. 
Bryce, Mum asked if you could go and help her in the garden, please. Bryce spat a rather rude word, something I would not think anyone from Mum's church would ever say. Still, he was dealing with Mum, so there were extenuating circumstances. I placed the large chocolate cake on a big plate and handed it to Beck. Would you please take this to the dining room and take orders for tea, coffee or cold drinks from everyone, please? As soon as Beck was out of sight, I turned to Jenny. There's no easy way to say this, but I know you were a client at the escort agency, the same one where Frank Wright was working. Jenny's face went deathly white. She leant back against the countertop and grasped it with both hands. But how? How did you know? I was glad she wasn't going to try to deny it. I can't say, I said firmly. Did you kill Frank? Jenny looked even more shocked. No, of course not. Her voice was little more than a whisper. Don't tell my husband, please. I won't tell him, I said. But do the police know? Jenny shook her head. Beck returned and appeared not to notice anything was amiss. Beck, would you mind getting everyone a drink, please? I need Jenny to help me in the office for a moment. Certainly. Beck busied herself with the coffee machine, and I nodded to Jenny. Once we were in Mum's office, I shut the door behind us. Do the police know? Jenny shook her head. They haven't asked me, so I suppose they don't know. What does it matter anyway? I didn't kill him. She said it forcefully, and I wondered if her earlier meek demeanor had been an act. The more information the detectives have, the better, I said reasonably. You really need to tell them. What if I refuse? In that case, I'll have to tell them, I said. I'm sure they won't tell your husband. They have no reason to, not if you're not the murderer. I'll tell them then, she spat and flung open the door. Mum practically fell inside the room. She smiled politely at Jenny and then shut the door behind her. That harlot, Mum screeched. Shush, Mum, she'll hear you. Huh? She won't know I'm talking about her. That poor woman's husband. I think it's disgraceful. Just as well Ian didn't hear about this disgusting mess. I'm glad for his sake that he went home. Her face was beet red, her eyes narrowed to mere slits. She was in one of her rages. Mum, it's really none of our business, I said in an attempt to placate her. Not my business, Mum screeched. I'll have you know it is my business. I'm going to ask them all to leave. She grabbed her phone and punched in some numbers. I held up my hands in surrender. That's entirely up to you, Mum, but surely you have a contract through the letting agency. I wasn't even out the door before I heard Mum speak on the phone. Ian, Laurel's upset me again. I marched back to the funeral home, furious. I knew I shouldn't let Mum get to me, but it was easier said than done. Anyway, first things first. I would ask Ernie to keep an eye on Jenny to see if she did, in fact, tell the detectives. Perhaps it hadn't been wise of me to confront her. If she was the killer, that could put me in danger. As I reached the garden, I saw a garden gnome I hadn't spotted before. It was a particularly hideous one, sitting upon a fly agaric mushroom. Only the spots were fluorescent blue. The Bible it was holding was black, as per usual. Just then the phone rang. I expected it was Mum calling to berate me. What is it now? I snapped. Laurel? I winced. Sorry, Basil, I've just had an argument with Mum. Basil chuckled. Worse than usual. No, not really. Sorry, I said again. I thought she was calling me. I got your text. How about dinner tonight? I'll call for you at six. All the tension drained from my body. Sounds great. Chapter 17 To my surprise, Basil took me to an Italian restaurant in the next town. I had heard about this restaurant. It was new, and it was expensive. At first glance, it appeared to be a trendy restaurant, yet it still retained its rustic charm. And there's nothing quite like the tantalizing aroma of food in an Italian restaurant. My heart fluttered at the thought of being on a date with Basil. He smelt of fresh soap of lime and lemongrass. I noticed he was cleanly shaven. I, likewise, had gone to my best efforts. 
He kissed me politely on the cheek, and it was all I could do not to throw my arms around his neck and kiss him properly. I was halfway into my chair when a crisply dressed waiter appeared with a basket of bread rolls and curled butter. He placed it, along with a bottle of ice water, between us and handed us the menus. As soon as he left, Basil leant forward. You look lovely tonight, Laurel. I smiled, probably more widely than would be considered cool. You do too. I soaked in the romantic ambience. A tea light candle was softly flickering in the center of the table, reflecting from the wine glasses. The music was soft and unobtrusive. The pungent yet delightful fragrance of garlic pervaded the air, making me all warm and fuzzy inside. My toes tingled. I must have drifted away with my thoughts because Basil's voice made me start. Champagne? I'd love some, I said. Did you get my text about Jenny? Basil nodded. Yes, you texted to say you'd call the escort agency, and then again to tell me what she said when you confronted her. That probably wasn't the wisest thing to do, I admitted, breaking apart my warm bread roll and then watching the butter melt into it. I've asked Ernie to keep an eye on her. Well, I found out something interesting today, Basil said. I looked up. What is it? You told me that Frank said he had a girlfriend and that he said she had nothing to do with his murder. I nodded. I didn't think any more of it until Mandy Major came to see me today. I jumped so suddenly that I knocked my fork onto my plate, causing it to make a loud clanging sound. I was embarrassed given that I could feel eyes on me. Why did she come to see you? It turns out that Frank Wright was an only child and had no living relatives. Mandy was his long-term girlfriend, and she stands to inherit everything. She's going to move to Witch Woods and live in his house. Rather, it will be her house soon. Isn't that a bit drastic, moving here? I asked him. Sure, small country towns had their charms, but they also had snakes, nasty spiders, and busybodies. I could walk down the street in Melbourne wearing something utterly bizarre and no one would give me a second glance. But here in Witch Woods, every passerby studied me closely. They were going to get married, so she was planning to move here regardless. I studied my knife and thought for a moment. So is that why she came to see you? Because she wants a new accountant? Basil nodded. Her current accountant is retiring at the end of the year, so she wants me to take over. Her business is quite simple. He addressed the latter remark to himself. I supposed it was an accountant thing. Did she say if he'd left her much money? Enough money for her to murder him? Basil consumed a whole bread roll at once before speaking. No, I don't think money could be the motive. I actually asked her for more details of her inheritance Details I'd need to know for accounting purposes, just so I could find that out. He did very well for himself, but he wasn't a millionaire. He didn't have enough money to be murdered for, and besides, they were getting married anyway. But I suppose it's all relative, I said. Basil looked puzzled. What's relative? The amount of money it would take for somebody to murder someone, I pointed out. One person might be prepared to murder for 50 million, while another person might be prepared to murder for $500. It all depends on one's circumstances. A man walked past and patted Basil on the shoulder. Basil introduced us, and the man moved on. We'll have to question Frank again, and make sure he doesn't avoid our questions this time. I agreed. Yes, that will certainly be much easier than questioning Mandy Major. Do you think he knows she did it? Do you think he's trying to protect her? Basil filled our champagne glasses before answering. It did occur to me, but then wouldn't he move on? I mean, if he was protecting her, that wouldn't keep him here. He would simply go on to the other side. I hadn't thought about it like that, I said. Yes, I think you're probably right. Still, he's obviously keeping something from us. Ernie suddenly manifested, sitting in the seat next to Basil, This time, I jumped so much that I knocked over my champagne glass. To my dismay, champagne ran in little rivulets along the once pristine white tablecloth. The waiter hurried over and cleaned it up, while I apologized profusely. 
Ernie, please don't appear like that when I'm trying to have a romantic date with my girlfriend, Basil said. My stomach did flip-flops when Basil said the word girlfriend. Ernie stared at me. Why are you wearing that stupid grin, Laurel? You look like a love-struck puppy. You're making my stomach turn. He shuddered. I at once changed the expression on my face before Basil saw me. Ernie pressed on. I've been following Jenny Thurigood as you asked me. She did indeed speak to the police. In fact, she went there in person, I suppose so that her husband wouldn't overhear her on the phone. Did you hear anything to make you think that she killed Frank? I asked him. Ernie shook his head. I don't have an opinion on it either way. I only know what she told the police, and that was that she saw some other escort at the escort agency. I forget his name. She said she'd never met Frank. Anyway, the police will soon find out if she's lying, so I figure she must be telling the truth about that. And by the way, I wasn't able to get anything out of Frank. He flatly refuses to say a word about his girlfriend. I pulled a face. That's a nuisance. And if Jenny did know Frank, it would have been outside the escort business, Basil said. Ernie, would you mind leaving us now? Do you want to continue with your lovey-dovey, schmoochy, romantic evening? Ernie was clearly disgusted. Basil nodded. As a matter of fact, we do. Ernie disappeared in a flash. Basil refilled my champagne glass. To us. I was glad Ernie couldn't see the expression on my face. I'm going to say one more thing about this murder investigation, and then let's not let it intrude on our evening, Basil said in a tone that caused tingles to flood my body. I readily agreed. Since Frank won't say a word about Mandy, we'll have to question her directly. You have her new address on file, I said, more thinking out aloud than asking a question. Yes. Frank's address here in Witch Woods. We won't need to go to her house, though. Mandy mentioned that she was going to the new markets tomorrow. I knew what I would be doing the following day. Chapter 18 Basil and I arrived at the farmer's market early. The farmer's market was new to Witch Woods. There had been a bit of a buzz around town about it. But now that I was here... I was rather disappointed. I knew it wouldn't be as good as the markets I had attended in Melbourne, of course, but there didn't seem to be many sellers. The woman at the first tent jumped out in front of me and thrust a plate of lumpy and anemic-looking cookies topped with blueberries directly under my face. Would you like to try one? I sidestepped her. No, thanks. I smiled to make up for my refusal. She blocked my way once more. You don't eat cookies? Gluten intolerant. That was the first thing that came to my mind. I hurried past her, past the rows of potted plants already wilted in the sun, the large display of jars of honey under bright orange awnings, and past huge displays of organic fruit and vegetables. What if she doesn't come after all? I said to Basil. What was that? Basil moved even closer to me. I repeated myself in a louder voice. Over by a clump of gum trees, a live band was playing so loudly it was hard to hear myself think. Two young children ran past me, the second one knocking me hard directly behind my knees, causing my knees to buckle. Basil seized my arm and righted me as the apologetic mother hurried after her children. I gravitated towards the coffee sellers. Why don't I get us some coffee and you look around for Mandy? I yelled in Basil's ear. If you see her, call me. I pulled my phone from my tote and pointed to it. Basil shouted back that it was a good idea. I lined up behind the people desperate for their morning coffee. The coffee smelt really good, but then again, I suppose any coffee smells good early in the morning. The line was right next to braids of garlic, which didn't smell so good in the morning. After I drank some coffee, I felt immeasurably better and went in search of Basil. Have you seen her? I asked him, handing him his coffee. No, but many of the stallholders are still setting up. Let's give it some time before we think about going. I wasn't thinking about leaving yet, I said, somewhat puzzled. You might change your mind. Basil moved aside, 
but before I could see what concerned him, the blueberry seller stepped across my path once more. Sampler blueberry, she said to me. You can eat those, I'm sure. Without waiting for me to answer, she continued. We grow them right next to the highway, so they're not organic. We don't use chemicals on them, so you could call them organic, but we do spray them with a very strong fungicide. Sure, it's a very poisonous fungicide, but I do my best not to spray it on the berries. She thrust the plate of fungicide-riddled blueberries under my nose. I'm allergic, I lied, hurrying past her. I soon ground to a halt and ducked under the awning of a jewellery store. Mum and Ian were standing on an upturned crate, waving their arms in the air. What are they doing? I asked Basil in shock. Directly behind me, I heard the blueberry seller arguing loudly with someone about the difference between chemical-free and organic. They're telling everyone to repent, Basil said in dismay. They're yelling so they can be heard over the live band. But the live band has just stopped, I said. As soon as I said it, the live band started up again. Basil simply shrugged. I had better keep an eye out for John Jones, I said. He likely isn't far behind the two of them. Perhaps it was a bad idea coming here, Basil said. I thought we could have some fun and also question Mandy, but we can't have any fun with your mother around. I slipped my free arm through his. Sure, we can have some fun. We just won't come back anywhere near Mum and Ian. We joined the crowd moving en masse away from Mum and Ian. I hoped they didn't change their position any time soon. It was fun walking past all the produce, the artwork, and homemade jewellery on display. I stopped to look at some handmade soap and had just bought some when Basil spoke. Mandy Major's here now. I followed him out of the tent. We both walked past Mandy as if we were just out for a stroll. She spotted Basil and came over. Basil introduced me once more as his girlfriend, which made my stomach do flip-flops. Mandy is coming to live in Witchwoods, Basil said, as if it were the first time he was telling me. I'm her new accountant. I played along. Welcome to Witchwoods. What brings you to town? Mandy stared at the ground before answering. My boyfriend just died. We were about to get married, so I'm moving to town anyway. I've been coming to town on a regular basis anyway. I'm a beauty therapist. I'm so sorry to hear about your boyfriend, I said, suddenly painfully aware that her boyfriend died in my mother's house and that my mother was the prime suspect. I hoped that Mandy did not connect the dots. Mandy nodded. Do the police have any idea what happened to him? Basil asked her. Mandy shook her head. If they do, then they haven't told me. No, they're following me. It's bad enough having to deal with Frank's death without being harassed by the detectives. I looked behind her, and sure enough, Detective Prescott and Detective Wilkinson were lurking in the background. It seemed to me that they were keeping an eye on my mother rather than Mandy, but I was not about to point that out. I took Basil's full coffee cup and dumped his and mine in a nearby trash bin, much to Basil's amazement. That coffee was disgusting, I said. We were about to go and get some nice coffee from that tent over there. Why don't you join us? Mandy hesitated, but then looked back at the detectives who were now walking in our direction. Thanks, that would be good, she said. I felt a little mean, as my intention was to question her, rather than make her feel welcome to the town but I suppose they weren't mutually exclusive. I went to buy the coffee, leaving Basil chatting to Mandy. After all, she knew him. I returned with a tray of coffee and placed a polystyrene cup in front of each of them. I got some chocolate chip cookies too, I said, depositing the individually wrapped offerings on the table. I think my friend Tara has mentioned you. You do her eyebrows. Mandy looked a little happier. Yes, she's nice. I hope I can build up my business here. At that moment, the detectives walked past us. Mandy became visibly nervous. They questioned me at length, and I don't know why, she said in little more than a whisper. I wasn't even in town when Frank was murdered. I suppose you have a firm alibi, I asked her. She shook her head and dabbed at her eyes with a tissue. No, that's just it. 
Plus, I was silly enough to be honest with them and tell them I had a huge fight with him the night before he died. I'm sure they don't suspect you, I said. What motive could you possibly have? It wasn't as if he left you a million dollars or anything, did he? Mandy shook her head. He didn't have a mortgage on his house, and he had very expensive clothes, and he had a lot of investments, but I wouldn't exactly call him a millionaire. He might have been if he hadn't been such a big-time spender. I muttered my sympathies. Mandy scrunched the tissue in her hands into a little ball and then turned it over and over. Finally, she spoke. I suppose you're wondering why I was going to marry an escort. I was taken aback by her frank question, no pun intended. Luckily, Basil spoke up. No, not at all, Mandy. I assume you didn't know? He said it as a question. Mandy sniffled into a fresh tissue. I found out the night before he died. That's what I told the detectives, too. I thought the fact that I was innocent meant I didn't have to hide anything. But I was wrong. I'm sure they think I did it. I hurried to reassure her once more. I'm sure they don't, Mandy. I'm sure that no matter what you told them, it wasn't anything that would make them suspect you. They're just covering all angles. Mandy sipped her coffee before speaking. That's where you're wrong. I do have a motive, at least in their eyes. The night before he died, I found a second phone. It was definitely hidden, and I challenged him about it. I thought he had another girlfriend. What did he say? I asked her. Well, he just broke down and told me the whole story. He said it paid well, and it wasn't personal. He said it wasn't anything like having an affair, that it was purely business. He told you, I said in disbelief. Mandy nodded. He said he had intended to tell me before we were married, but I don't believe that. He'd been lying to me for years. He always told me he was a day trader working from home. I suppose he got away with it because I only stayed with him every second weekend. So he never went to work when you were visiting? Mandy's expression changed from sad to angry. Yes, as a matter of fact, he did several times. He said he was volunteering at the local mission, and he said I wasn't to visit him because there were some dangerous types there. And to think I believed him. I feel like such an idiot now. I had a huge screaming argument with him. I threw my engagement ring at him and then drove home to the coast. I think I fell out of love with him at that very moment. I don't even know if it's possible, but I think I did, when I realized how badly he'd lied to me all that time. Plus, he was a terrible flirt. He was always flirting with other women, and that upset me too. Unfortunately, I told the police all this. Look, the detectives just got coffee and left. They walked straight behind you, I told her. They didn't give you so much as a second glance. I really don't think they're keeping an eye on you. As an afterthought, simply because I was curious, I added, who is taking care of his funeral? The brothel, she spat angrily. One of them came to his house to tell me that they were. I didn't care. Better them than me. I don't even plan to attend. It's going to feel awkward enough living here in his house. I think I'm going to have to see a therapist or something. That's a good idea, I said. I felt sorry for the woman. She was certainly having a hard time of it, and now she was moving to the very town where it had all happened. Her boyfriend's duplicity, and then his murder. I also wondered why the escort agency hadn't booked Frank's funeral at my funeral home. I wondered if they, like the detectives, thought my mother was the murderer. I looked outside to see people staring in the direction where I had last seen my mother, and then my phone rang. Chapter 19 Laurel, you have to help me, Mum's voice insisted. Mum, what's wrong? It's the police. They're trying to force me to partake in an abomination, something new age. She almost spat the words. I'll be right there. 
I turned to Basil. It's mum. To Mandy, I said. Nice to meet you. I've got to go and help my mother. I shot Basil a look which I hoped he would interpret to mean that I wanted him to keep Mandy there. I hurried outside and headed in the direction where I had last seen mum and Ian standing on crates, yelling at people to repent. I'm not psychic, I heard mum say angrily as I approached. I'll have you know that psychicness is of the devil. What's this about? I asked Detective Prescott. His face was beet red. We want your mother to come with us for a psych evaluation. Is it compulsory? I asked him. I shot a look around me. People had gathered to stare. Some were just standing there staring, while others were doing their best to pretend they weren't. It must have been obvious to them that the men speaking to mum were police officers. No, but it would be good if she would agree. I frowned. Ian, can you call mum's lawyer, please? I already called him, Ian said. He said she should take the test, but Thelma said he was no use, and so she was going to call you as a last resort. Thanks, I think, I said through clenched teeth. Detective Prescott was still trying to explain. It's nothing to do with being psychic, Mrs. Bay, and it's not a test as such. It's a psychiatric evaluation. It will simply be someone asking you questions. Mum looked perplexed. Do I have to guess things? Prescott rubbed his temples hard. No, you just have to answer truthfully. Mum drew herself up to her full height and crossed her arms over her chest. Why wouldn't I answer truthfully? I'm not a liar. Liars don't inherit the kingdom of God. I insist that Ian comes with me. Ian looked afraid. I need to get home to Audrey. Audrey? Mum screeched. I thought the two of you were no longer a couple. Does she still light candles? Anyone may accompany you, but no one can be in the room while you are answering questions, Prescott said. Wilkinson was doing his best to fade into the background. Will there be ink blots? Mum asked. Prescott shook his head. I don't know. Well, what do you know? Mum said rudely. Mum, I'll go with you, I said. I remembered what the YouTube videos said about scapegoat children and thought the better of it, but too late. I had already offered. I'll just have to go by my office and collect something, if that's okay. I assume it's at the police station? Prescott nodded. You don't need to collect anything, Mum said rudely. I took the advice I had seen on YouTube. Suit yourself, I'm not coming. Mum's mouth opened and shut. I made to move away, but Mum called after me. All right then, but make it fast, I'll go with you. I texted Basil to fill him in, but I didn't have time to correct the autocorrects. Goodness knows what message was delivered. The drive to the funeral home was tedious, with Mum making snarky remarks as to why I was making the detour. If you say one more thing, Mum, I won't go with you. I finally snapped. Thankfully, we passed the remainder of the journey in silence. Once there, I hurried into my office. I had no time to check if Janet was there, so I couldn't call too loudly. Ernie, Ernie, are you there? I said in a stage whisper. He appeared at once. What is it now? They're taking Mum in for a psych evaluation. I didn't have a chance to say anything more as Ernie burst into loud guffaws of laughter. I tapped my foot and waited for him to stop laughing. Have you quite finished? No, he said and laughed some more. I'm in a hurry, Ernie. Mum's waiting in the car. I can't go into the questioning with her, so I wondered if you would, please, and tell me what they say. Okay. Ernie wore a big grin from ear to ear. This should be fun. I have no idea why you're trying to help her, though. Neither do I, I muttered. Five minutes later, I was sitting on a hard wooden seat in a freezing waiting room at the police station, regretting my decision. Someone had turned the air conditioning way too high. Ernie appeared. They're doing this to prove she doesn't have a case of defense of mental impairment, he said. That was obvious, but all I could do was nod slightly. The psych guy looks like Freud himself, 
and he told the detectives that many psychologists use Rorschach ink blots to gauge personality and measure emotional stability. I raised my eyebrows. He's going to make her do the M fast. The what? I pretended to sneeze to cover my remark. Five women were sitting opposite me, all staring at me. I smiled at them and wriggled my eyebrows at Ernie. Ernie sighed long and hard. This isn't easy, you know. It stands for the Miller Forensic Assessment of Symptoms Test. It's to tell if she's stark raving bonkers. You know, to see if she's faking it, so she can get off a murder charge by pretending to be completely nuts. That worried me. I had once googled it on my phone. It told me that the MFAST was used to evaluate criminal defendants who were pleading not guilty by reason of insanity. I bit my lip. It seemed they were going to charge Mum after all. Ernie pointed behind me. I turned to see a young man walking over to me. Laurel Bay. I stood up. Yes, I'm your mother's lawyer, Luke Dillon. We shook hands. May I speak frankly? I ignored Ernie, who was doubling over with laughter. Yes, please do. I would prefer your mother engage a criminal lawyer. I'm just out of law school and I do contract law. I don't know anything about criminal law. You're preaching to the choir, I said. Once mum's made up her mind, she won't listen to anyone. Do the police intend to charge her? He nodded solemnly. I'm afraid it's looking that way. They wouldn't do the psych evaluation if they didn't intend to charge her. I frowned. Why haven't they charged her yet? They're lining up everything, getting their evidence together. They think she's deliberately pretending to be, um, a bit strange, as a murder defence. I bent down to scratch my foot and then swatted at the pesky mosquito responsible. What motive do they think she has? He shook his head. You don't need a motive to charge somebody with murder in Australia. I was perplexed. Well, surely they don't think she just suddenly decided to murder Frank for no reason. They think she did it because she found out what sort of escort he really was, the lawyer said. Told you so, Ernie said. I waved my hand at him, but then stopped when the lawyer looked at me strangely. Mosquitoes, I said. I've already been bitten. Is there any way you could convince Mum to get a criminal lawyer? He shook his head. I've tried, believe me. Thelma won't employ anyone who doesn't go to our church. I've tried to warn her about the pitfalls of that, but she won't listen. I sensed the hint of warning in his voice. What do you mean? I'm sure there are some who attend our church just to get business, and for no other reason than that, he said in hushed tones. I've discussed it with Pastor Green, and he's as concerned as I am. Still, nothing can be done. Just then, Mum appeared. Let's all go for a nice cup of tea, she said cheerily. We'll go to the True Vine Garden Cafe. That's my favourite cafe, and the owners go to our church, don't they, Luke? Luke and I exchanged glances. Minutes later, we were sitting at the True Vine Garden Cafe, which was just around the corner from the police station. I never went there without mum, because the coffee was as weak as dishwater. Still, it was a pretty place, the cafe's tables and chairs placed in the midst of the plants and gifts for sale. The huge windows were opened to the outdoor plants, all in their groups. That's a pretty plant, I said, gesturing to some vivid blue delphiniums. Wrong colour, mum snapped. I rolled my eyes. Everything in Mum's garden was red or pink. Mum pulled out her purse and made a show of taking out money. My treat, she said loudly, waving a handful of money in the air and grinning. Everyone in the cafe turned to look at her. Luke protested, but Mum either didn't hear or chose to ignore him. What are you all having? I shook my head at Luke. I knew it was pointless to protest. I'll come with you and give my order, I said to Mum. Luke, what are you having? Luke quickly scanned the menu and said he would have a mango smoothie and a mushroom and red onion bruschetta. I walked the short distance to the countertop with mum to give our orders. I'll have black English breakfast tea, please, mum said to the waitress. And that's black, meaning no milk. 
Every time I ask for black tea, they give me milk. Don't they know what the meaning of black is? It means without milk. Are you having anything else with that? The waitress asked Mum. Yes, cinnamon toast. I don't want butter on it, just cinnamon toast. I don't want raisin toast, and I only want one slice. The waitress looked at me expectantly, so I ordered both mine and Luke's. The waitress rang up the order and told us the amount. Mum's handful of money had mysteriously vanished. Mum looked at me, so I handed the waitress my credit card. When we returned to the table, Luke thanked Mum. You're welcome, she said. Luke leant forward. Now, Thelma, tell me what's happened. Mum stared into space. Nothing, really, she said absently. Do you see those big brass crosses? I think one would look good in my dining room. It would do the guests good to think on it while they ate. Actually, it would make a good gift. Luke appeared to be at a loss, but I was used to dealing with her. Mum, what questions did the man ask you? He did show me ink blots after all. I said he would. I was in two minds whether or not to ask, but I finally did so. And what did you think they were? Think, Laurel? I didn't think I knew. They were pictures of Satan himself. Luke gasped, but quickly recovered. Anything else, Thelma? Or just Satan? Well, there were fallen angels too, Mum said thoughtfully. And demons, lots of demons. And they were all naked. Luke turned white. Thelma, I really think you need a criminal lawyer. He was going to say more, but our drinks arrived. I said no milk, Mum snapped, jabbing her finger at the little white milk jug that the waiter had just deposited in front of her. Why does this always happen? I said black tea. Why would you give me milk? I'll take it back, the waiter said. Good. Do you have a new manager? The already stressed waiter looked puzzled. No, why? The service is worse than last time. I muttered apologies to the waiter, who beat a hasty retreat. He soon returned with the food. This time, Mum remained silent. Luckily, no one spoke over the meal. I figured that Luke had given up trying to convince Mum to get a criminal lawyer. I was looking forward to leaving, and I still hadn't found out the outcome of Mum's questioning. The waiter returned to clear the table. How was your food? He asked Mum. Do you have a dog? Mum said in a snarky tone. The waiter frowned. No, I don't. Because this food is only fit for a dog. So I thought if you had a dog, you could take it home and give it to your dog. I certainly wasn't able to eat it. Like I said, it's only fit for a dog. I was just writing a note on this napkin to leave you to tell you what I thought about the food. She used her most smug tone and she was the queen of smug tones. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Sorry, I said to the waiter. I stood up. Goodbye, I said to Mum and Luke. I couldn't get away fast enough. Chapter 20 Ernie appeared in the seat beside me as I was driving back to the funeral home. Watch the road! he said after I jumped and screamed. Ernie, you scared me, I said, shaken as I regained control of the car. I've asked you not to appear all of a sudden like that in the car, Ernie shrugged. The detective said your mother doesn't meet the criteria to be on a compulsory treatment order. What on earth does that mean? No idea. Do they think she's pretending to be mad, criminally insane or whatever they call it? Ernie sighed. I don't know, but the suspense is terrible. I waited there for ages, but that weird psych guy kept going through his notes. I think Prescott and Wilkinson were as impatient as I was. Anyway, I finally gave up, and here I am. Excuse me a moment. I had diverted the calls from the funeral home to my mobile phone, and one was coming through my car's Bluetooth. Good afternoon, Witchwood's funeral home. How may I help you? It's Bryce, the gruff voice said. Your mother's not answering her phone. Is she with you? No, I just left her, I said. 
she has a blocked sewer pipe. I've called the plumber. You better come quick. With that, he hung up. I shot Ernie a sidelong glance. I was about to tell him that it was nothing to do with me. Ernie held up a hand. Just a moment. The cops are closing in on your mother fast. If you really want to help the older, uh, uh, your mother, then this might give you a chance to do some scouting. I swerved to miss a snake. It was a big eastern brown and moving fast. How so? I said after I shuddered. I made a mental note not to shove my hand blindly in the garden to retrieve one of mum's garden gnomes now that the weather was warming up. Snake season was well and truly here. If it's not your mother, and it's not the dead guy's girlfriend, then it has to be one of the six guests or that builder guy, right? Right, I said. Well, you have seven suspects all in the one place. If you pretend to be interested in the blocked sewer pipe, then you might find out something. Who knows? I thought about it for a moment. It was either paperwork or sewerage. Good idea, I said. I bypassed the funeral home and drove straight to Mum's house. The plumber was already there, just getting his toolbox out of his vehicle. He looked over and smiled. Hi, Laurel, what's the problem? I don't know, Simon. Bryce, the builder, just called me and said he couldn't get in touch with Mum. The plumber was easy going for someone Mum liked. I had spoken to him on several occasions previously. He seemed a nice enough guy, but I had used a different plumber when I'd renovated my apartment. The less Mum and I had in common, the better. We both walked inside in search of Bryce, who was banging away in the kitchen. He looked up when we approached. I don't know anything about it, he grunted. That woman, Jenny, said the toilet in the main bathroom was blocked. He went back to his hammering. I raised my eyebrows at Simon. Come on, I'll show you the way. Jenny wasn't there. In fact, there was no one in sight. Simon looked at the toilet and scratched his head. He made some non-committal noises and then opened his toolbox. It's good that Thelma's giving Bryce some work, he said. Most people wouldn't, given how rude he is and the exorbitant prices he charges. I wondered if Simon was trying to warn me about Bryce. I opened my mouth to say something, but Simon continued. Bryce has serious financial troubles, or so he says. He's a very angry man. Still, I wouldn't like to be in his position. Not that it's any excuse. Can you hand me that wrench? No, the big wrench. I did as I was asked. What do you mean, his position? He's paying a lot of child support. He always complains to the church and they give him money. Constantly. I was surprised. It seems he does good business. Simon nodded. Yes, he does. So it all seems a bit strange. And he's convinced that his wife ran off with some man. But the way he was treating her, he only had himself to blame. I finished the plumbing in the kitchen the other day. And I have to wonder why he's taking so long to finish the job. I assume your mother's paying him by the hour. Um, uh, I don't know, I stammered. Do you think he's getting money from the church under false pretenses? When Simon looked up from the toilet, his face was flushed, no pun intended. It's not for me to say, he said. I think I've said too much. Still, I don't like to see him taking financial advantage of women, even your mother. He stuck his head back in the toilet. Okay, now what? That was the question I asked myself. I averted my eyes from the drab orange curtains and leant against the cold, tiled wall while I ran through the suspects, barely distracted by Simon muttering to himself. Was it Frank's girlfriend, Mandy? She had the most apparent motive. She'd had a furious argument with him right before he died. Significantly, she didn't have an alibi. Then there were the suspects in Mum's house. Bryce, who was possibly something of a con man, and the guests. I knew Jenny sold hat pins in her store and knew that she had employed the services of an escort from Frank's agency. Then there was her husband, James. His possible motive was jealousy. I'll wait downstairs for you, Simon. I don't know where my mother is. Simon straightened up and stretched. No worries. I don't think this is going to be much of a problem, but I'll call out if I need something. I walked back down the stairs, thinking about my paperwork. 
It wasn't going to do itself, so I had to stop finding ways to avoid it. The phone ringing in my pocket made me jump. I pulled it out and looked at the screen. It was a number I didn't recognize, but then again, I still had my office phone diverted. Good morning, Witchwood's Funeral Home. How may I help you? Laurel, it's Luke. I knew from the tone of his voice that something was wrong, very wrong. Is now a good time to talk, he said. I wished he would come to the point. Yes, the police have just informed me that they're about to arrest your mother. I came to an abrupt stop on the stairs and clutched the banister. Horrors, she didn't do it. Yes, I know, but the police don't. Laurel, I'm going to need some help to convince her that she needs a criminal lawyer. I've never been able to convince my mother to do anything, I said. The thing is, Luke said, I won't be able to represent her properly. She simply has to have a criminal lawyer and there's no other option. I was frustrated. Luke, she won't listen to me. What about Pastor Green or Ian? If anyone can get my mother to do something, it's those two. I'm on my way to speak to the pastor now, Luke said. What evidence do they have against her? Just the fact that he was in her house when he died. So were seven other people. Plus the hatpins were in easy reach of everyone. You might say I've watched too many episodes of NCIS, but isn't this purely circumstantial evidence? Luke agreed. They haven't found the hatpin that was used in the murder. I tried to process the information. So are you saying that if they find the hatpin that killed Frank, and it was one of my mother's hatpins, then that would pretty much seal her fate? It wouldn't help. But we don't need to worry about that, because she didn't do it. Quite so, I stood up. I didn't put that well. What I meant to say was, can they easily get a conviction without the murder weapon? I can't see how, Luke said. Anyone in the house had access to the hat pins, and they were in the open for all to see. That's good to hear. By the way, do you know where my mother is? Yes, she's still at the True Vine Garden Cafe. Luke said. She seems to be buying up big. I groaned. She must think she needs some retail therapy. Please let me know how it goes with Pastor Green. Chapter 21 I went into the kitchen to make some coffee, and I was pleased to see there was no sign of Bryce. I had stopped having sugar in my coffee a week or so previously, but I thought now was a good time to get back into the habit. I scooped in a heaped spoon and stirred it well. What was I going to do? I couldn't help but think I was close to solving this matter. Something was eluding me, some small thing I was sure would help me put the pieces together. I ran my hand over the new countertop. His work looked good enough but I wondered if Bryce was, in fact, taking advantage of my mother financially. He certainly wouldn't be the first person to do so. He had taken ages on a job that surely could have been completed in half the time. But did that make him a murderer? What possible motive could he have? So far, my three suspects with motives were James and Jenny Thorogood and Mandy, Frank's girlfriend. Yet anyone else could have a motive. It's just that I didn't know what it was yet. I was on my fifth triple chocolate cookie when Simon came down the stairs. All fixed, he announced. Just tell those guests not to put anything down there that shouldn't go down there. I'll tell mum, I said. I don't know where the guests are today. They won't be back until dinner, Simon said. Bryce told me that when he called earlier. I suppose that was something to be grateful for. It wouldn't look too good if the detectives dragged Mum kicking and screaming out of the house in front of the guests. That is, assuming they arrested her when she came home and didn't find her on her shopping spree at the cafe. Before you go, Simon, I said, I wanted to ask you something. Bryce isn't here at the moment, but I'm worried about Mum. I know he's charging her a ridiculously large amount. Mum won't listen to me but I thought I should speak to Pastor Green about the situation. Is there anything else you could tell me about Bryce? I don't want to put you in an awkward position, though. Simon put down his toolbox and scratched his head. I don't know that much. 
only that he joined the church after his wife left him. He's asked me for money, and I know he's asked other people for money as well. I probably shouldn't be saying this, but I've often wondered if he only joined the church to get money. And if you don't mind me saying so, Laurel, your mother's a little gullible. Yes, I know, I said. Well, there are lots of other people like her in the church who also won't employ anyone who doesn't go to our church, and I think that he might be taking advantage of that. Put it this way, I might be right and I might be wrong, but I've always felt he only joined the church for those reasons. You know, for networking. He always says very nasty things about his ex-wife. His wife didn't leave him for an escort, did she? I asked. No, I smiled. It was a long shot. But Bryce thinks she left him because of an escort. He thinks if she hadn't hired the escort, then it would never have occurred to her to leave him. She didn't leave him for another man, though. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Are you saying that Bryce's wife actually employed an escort? Simon picked up his tool bag. It's not for me to judge. With that, he smiled and walked out of the room. I had once texted Basil and told him my suspicions about Bryce. I drew the heavy brocade curtains aside and looked out the window, but there was still no sign of mum. I wondered if the police had already arrested her. I went back to the kitchen to fetch more coffee and tried her phone again. It went straight to voicemail. This is Mrs. Bay. If you are hearing this, it means I am not here, so please leave your name and address. I shook my head. Just then, Mum's landline rang, so I dropped my phone next to the coffee machine and hurried to answer it. Laurel, did you call me? I had a missed call from you. Was that you? Yes, Mum. Where are you? I asked urgently. I didn't want to call back on your mobile phone because you weren't able to get the call through to me. I thought you might be waiting for me at my house. Mum, listen. She cut me off. Pastor Green's calling. She hung up. I breathed a huge sigh of relief. Hopefully, the long-suffering Pastor Green could talk some sense into her. There was no point hanging around Mum's house any longer. As I was walking back to the funeral home, Bryce's car pulled up. He got out of the car and called after me. Have you seen your mother? I don't think she's going to be home for a long time, I said. Silently, I added, probably 15 years. Bryce did not respond. He just turned his back and trudged into Mum's house. I shivered and continued on my way back to the funeral home. Bryce was starting to look more suspicious. I really needed to speak to Frank, but he had been avoiding me ever since he thought I suspected his girlfriend. As soon as I walked into the funeral home, I called out, Frank, Frank, it's urgent. There was no response. I walked into my office and called out again. Nothing. Frank, I know you're there. I need to talk to you right now. I have a suspect and it's not your girlfriend. I waited a few minutes and then called out again. Frank, you won't be able to cross over until we find your murderer. I don't think it's your girlfriend, but I do have a suspect and I need to speak to you about him now. Frank slowly manifested in front of me. I came straight to the point. Frank, did you ever have a client by the name of Mrs. Wilson? I realized then that I did not know her name. What's this about? Frank asked me. It was clear he was still suspicious, if not a little paranoid. Frank, I don't have time for this. The police are about to arrest my mother, and I honestly don't think Mandy had anything to do with your murder. I'm now thinking it might have been someone called Bryce Wilson. It's just a hunch. I need to know if his wife was ever a client of yours. Frank assumed his full form. What's her name? I don't know her name. I only know that she was Bryce Wilson's wife. She had a whole bunch of kids and she left him about five years ago, I think. I've heard he's not a very nice man and he blamed the escort for her leaving him. Frank tapped his head. Oh, yes, it's all coming back to me now. Brenda, Brenda Wilson. She only ever wanted to talk. The husband was pretty mean to her and her kids from what she said. She had a terrible time. Last I spoke to her, she was planning to leave him. I'm glad she did. I thought for a moment. 
Frank, did you ever meet her husband, Bryce Wilson? Frank snorted rudely. Well, I wouldn't say met him exactly, but the last time I saw Brenda, her husband was supposed to be away fishing. Anyway, as I was leaving their house, he came home early and tried to hit me with his car. Did he get a good look at you? I suppose he did. He was yelling obscenities out the window, and he had me blocked with his car against the wall. I didn't see him because the car windows were tinted. Anyway, I ran away as soon as I could. I was worried that he'd take it out on poor Brenda, but then I heard she left town. Good for her. So you wouldn't recognize Bryce if you saw him again? Frank shook his head. I didn't even see him in the first place. But he got a good look at you. He sure did. And if Brenda hadn't called the police, he would have killed me, most likely. I was trying to put two and two together. Okay. Did you meet the builder when you were at my mother's house? Yes, why? That was Bryce Wilson. Frank's mouth formed a perfect O shape. You're kidding. My mother didn't introduce you. He went to answer, but I forestalled him. No, try to remember clearly before you say anything. This is important. Frank waved a hand at me in dismissal. I told you there was nothing wrong with my memory. I remember it well, because I thought it was strange. Your mother introduced me as her escort and introduced him as a wonderful blessing from the Lord. I wondered why she didn't use his name. Since I've been dead, I realize that's typical of her. I shuddered. I'll have to call the police. I reached into my pocket for my phone, but it wasn't there. Missing something. The angry voice came from behind me. Chapter 22 I swung around. It was Bryce. I stood frozen to the spot, horror-stricken. What do you want? I stammered. He waved my phone at me. I read everything you texted your boyfriend. You think I murdered that man? Of course I don't, I lied. I'm just looking at the suspects one by one. I think Jenny Thorogood murdered him. Bryce laughed, but it was more of a grunting sound, like a wild pig when it comes across something it could kill in the bushes. He was holding a hat pin in a gloved hand. I also heard you on the phone to the police about this hat pin. I went home to get it, and I was going to bring it back and put it somewhere to implicate your mother. That's when I came across your phone. I probably wouldn't have even read it, only for the fact that there was an incoming text mentioning me right when I was looking at it. I had hoped to convince him that I didn't suspect him, but now that he had come out and all but confessed to the murder, the game was up. And now I'm going to take care of you and pin it on your mother. I wondered if he knew he had made a pun, and then wondered why I even thought that when I was in mortal danger. I figured my best chance was to reason with him. So you intend to murder me and make it look like my mother did it? I asked him, trying to speak without my voice shaking. He raised the hat pin and took a step towards me. Everyone knows your mother dislikes you. She's always saying terrible things about you to everyone at church. She says you're good for nothing, and she's sorry she ever had you. The police already think she killed that man because of her religious fervor, and they'll think she killed you too in a fit of madness. I narrowed my eyes, furious with my mother. Still, perhaps Bryce was exaggerating. I hoped so anyway. Why don't you make her run for it? Just go to another state. Or even another country, then you won't have to pay any child support. The police already think Mum's only pretending to be insane. Everyone knows that Mum wouldn't be able to overpower me, so it'll look obvious that someone else is the murderer, not Mum. Bryce ignored my words and charged at me, the hat pin raised to strike. Before I even had a chance to take evasive action, Mum burst into the room. Laurel, why aren't you answering your phone? She snapped at me. I need help carrying all my bags to the house. Bryce, I'm so pleased to see you. I bought you this lovely gift for doing such a wonderful job on my kitchen. I had once noticed two things. Firstly, 
Mum was struggling with a giant metal cross. Secondly, she didn't seem to notice that anything was amiss, namely that Bryce was trying to kill me with her hat pin. Bryce appeared to be momentarily taken aback, but I knew it wouldn't take him much time to rally. The thought flashed across my mind that he would kill us both and make it look like I killed Mum while defending myself. Bryce grabbed my arm, and I stomped on his foot. It had no effect. Bryce spun around to face Mum, the hat pin in his other hand. No, Thelma, stop right there. Mum hurried over to him, struggling with the cross. They won't take no for an answer, Bryce. You're supposed to accept gifts. All the evangelists I watch on TV say you must never refuse a gift. They never refuse gifts, and look how God has blessed them. They're all multimillionaires. And you will be blessed too, Bryce, if you accept gifts. Bryce lunged at Mum with the hat pin. For some reason, she appeared to think he wanted to shake her hand. She stuck her hand out towards him in a handshaking gesture. As she did so, she lost hold of the giant metal cross. It fell forward and struck Bryce on the head. He dropped like a rock. Mum shrieked and hurried over to Bryce's body sprawled on the ground and patted him on the cheek. She stood up and glared at me. Look what you've done, Laurel. This is all your fault. If you had only helped me carry all my shopping bags, I wouldn't have dropped that cross on this poor man. What if you've killed him? He's the murderer, Mum, I said sharply. I bent down to retrieve my phone from his pocket. Stop robbing the man, Laurel. Quiet, please. I snapped at her. Bryce has just confessed to killing Frank Wright. He was trying to kill me when you came in. Now please be quiet, because I have to call the police. Mum bent over Bryce and prayed for him. I was calling the police station when the detectives burst through the door. Bryce Wilson is the murderer, I said. Look at that hat pin. He came here to murder me because he knew I was onto him. I knew they were here to arrest Mum, and I was concerned they would think I was lying. After all, they hadn't heard his confession. If you test that hat pin, you'll find it was the murder weapon. He said he was going to murder me and make it look like mum did it. He came here to plant the hat pin somewhere in her house. The detectives appeared to be at a loss. Bryce Wilson's ex-wife employed the services of Frank Wright about five years ago, I continued. She left Bryce after that, and he's always blamed Frank. He's resentful because he has to pay child support. In fact, she actually had to call the police because Bryce was about to attack Frank. It will all be in the records. So how did you manage to knock him out? Detective Prescott asked me. It was mum, I said. She hit him on the head with the cross. It was an accident, mum said firmly. I was only trying to shake his hand. Prescott and Wilkinson exchanged glances. Chapter 23. I was sitting in the waiting room at the police station trying to hold a conversation with Ernie while at the same time trying to appear sane to onlookers. Frank's crossed over now, Ernie said. I nodded, trying to disguise the movement as a neck stretch. I had already given my statement and Bryce had confessed. Mum was still giving her statement. It must have been the longest attempt to take a statement on record and I figured they were trying to make some sort of sense of what she was saying. Goodness knows where poor Pastor Green was, probably lying down with a cold pack on his head. He should be so lucky. Basil was sitting on one side of me, and Ian was sitting on the other. Basil had his arm firmly around me, holding me so tightly that I was partly out of my chair. I was uncomfortable, but I was liking every second of it. Please stop nearly being murdered, Laurel, Basil whispered in my ear. I couldn't bear it if anything happened to you. My phone rang. It was still diverted. Good morning. Sorry, afternoon. Witchwood's funeral home. How may I help you? Basil and Ian were both looking at me expectantly after I hung up. As you probably guessed from hearing one side of the conversation, that was the escort agency, I told them. Now that mum's been cleared of Frank's murder, they want me to conduct a themed funeral for him. And the theme is? Basil asked. Casanova? 
Ian looked puzzled, so I added, the famous Casanova, you know, from Venice. I'll go as a gondola, Ian said happily. Mum emerged from a door, followed by detectives Prescott and Wilkinson. Their faces were pale and slightly green. Both were clutching their heads. A funeral for Tom? Mum clapped her hands with delight. And you said a Casanova theme? Was Casanova a famous escort? I was at a loss how to explain it. Not exactly, but sort of. Haven't you heard of him? He lived in the 18th century. He didn't know they had escorts back in those times. Mum shrugged and tapped her chin thoughtfully. Yes, there were no electronic devices in the 18th century, so there must have been a need for escorts. I'll help you with his funeral, Laurel. I scratched my forehead. Thanks, Mum, but I didn't think you'd want to go to a Casanova-themed funeral. I think he was a polygamist. Mum pursed her lips in a gesture of disapproval. We don't get many from that denomination around here, but we all can't be Pentecostal. I don't condemn other denominations, even though they're all going to hell. It's not my place to condemn those heathens. You know, I don't judge Laurel. Basil snatched my hand. Let's get out of here. I didn't need telling twice. Where are we going? Does it matter? No. We hurried from the police station and drove away from Mum as fast as we could, heading for sanity. I'm trying to push the visions of Ian dressed as a gondola from my mind, I said. I don't even want to think what Mum will wear. I shuddered. Basil rested his hand on my knee, causing my body to tremble. Think about wine? chocolate, and ice cream instead. I know a great place, and it's not far from here. And then we'll go back to my home. I'll cook you dinner, and... His words hung on the air. I smiled with delight and relief, and leant back in my seat. This was a happy ending after all. This whole adventure had started badly, but it was ending with wine, ice cream, chocolate, and basil. The End. The next audiobook in this USA Today best selling series is Ghost Blusters. When the ghost of a punk rocker possesses Thelma, Laurel is tasked with solving the ghost's murder. If Laurel succeeds, the ghost will release her mother, which seems a shame, really. She's a lot nicer possessed. What will happen when possessed Thelma attends church and mixes with her snooty friends? Will her singing performance at the church concert cause any surprises? And what will Ian think? With the murderer still on the loose, Laurel must hurry before she becomes the next ghostly inhabitant of Witchwood's funeral home. If that ever happened, there's no chance she'd possess Thelma, unsolved murder or not. That's Ghost Blusters, book five in the Witchwood's funeral home series. You can find the series, as well as other audiobooks by Morgana Best, at morganabest.com. You've just listened to Ghost Stories, book four in the Witchwood's Funeral Home series, written by Morgana Best, narrated by Amy Soakes. Text copyright 2016 by Morgana Best. Audio production copyright 2023 by Morgana Best. If you've enjoyed this audiobook, please consider leaving a review and recommending on social media or directly to friends and family. And you can find other audiobooks by Morgana Best at morganabest.com. Thanks for listening.